My name is Thomas Kellerman, and this happened to me in July of 2002. I'm a park ranger at Yellowstone National Park, or at least I was then. Nature's my sanctuary, always has been. My wife laughs, says I was practically raised in the woods. That summer started off just like any other, enforcing campfire rules, shooing tourists off restricted hiking trails. The usual. Then one Thursday, after a morning of dealing with a particularly whiny group about geyser schedules, I heard it. Faint, but clear as a bell, a shriek echoed from the Pelican Valley area. Not animal, not human. Just wrong. Now, Yellowstone has its share of odd critters, but this sounded like nothing I'd heard before. A little part of me was scared, a bigger part was morbidly curious. I headed back to the ranger station, grabbed the long-range binoculars and my shotgun, just in case, before hiking to the edge of the valley. The shriek came again, louder this time. I scanned the trees, the rocky outcroppings, seeing nothing. But a flicker of movement in the valley bottom, there. Focusing the binoculars, I gasped. It was enormous, easily eight feet tall, covered in matted brown fur. The face, for just a second, was visible as it turned towards the sound, a long, canine muzzle contorted in a snarl, eyes like burning embers. It vanished back into the trees before I could take a clear look. That night I went home shaken, tried to tell my wife, Beth, but she just gave me that concerned smile that meant she thought I'd had too much sun. The next day, I told my supervisor about the sighting. He sighed, the same exasperated sigh I'd given to countless tourists claiming to have seen Bigfoot. Figures. But I knew... Whatever was out there, it wasn't on any wildlife roster. The calls kept happening, each day a little closer. My days off were non-existent. I was obsessed with catching sight of it again, tracking footprints larger than a dinner plate. Then came the disappearances. First a lone hiker, gear found but no body. Then two more, a family, their ravaged campsite was like a grizzly had taken offense, but something didn't feel right. The mess was too calculated, almost staged. Each disappearance fueled a sense of dread in me. This wasn't natural, wasn't random. This thing was hunting. That's when I started working late, going out after dark. Dumb in hindsight, I know, but I felt like if I didn't stop it, no one would. One night, about a month after the first hiker vanished, I was patrolling near Pelican Creek. Fog clung heavy to the ground, swirling around the trunks of the pines like ghostly figures. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I wasn't alone. From the darkness, a guttural growl echoed. It was close. I raised my shotgun, adrenaline coursing through me, peering into the fog. Then the eyes appeared, two glowing orbs cutting through the mist. I fired off a shot, more of a reflexive yell than a well-aimed bullet. The creature screamed, a horrifying, chilling sound that made my blood run cold. Then it lunged. I saw a flash of movement, a hulking form barreling through the fog. I fired again and again, then heard the sound of it crashing off into the undergrowth. I stood still, listening, heart pounding against my ribs. Silence. I carefully approached the place it had charged from, shotgun at the ready. Nothing but shattered branches and a few drops of dark blood on the ground. I was shaking uncontrollably. I'd seen it, really seen it this time and it was even bigger up close, impossibly fast. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't some overgrown wolf. Had I wounded it? Or had I just pissed it off? My hands trembled as I headed back to the station. I had to report this, had to make them believe me. I spent the next few days in a tense fog. 
I barely slept, my dreams a mix of growls, glowing eyes, and the splatter of blood against trees. I reported my encounter, showed the photos I'd snapped of its tracks. There was a search team bigger this time. But they found nothing in the area, no sign of the creature at all. The ranger higher-ups started murmuring. Stress leave. One mentioned, and I almost laughed. They wanted me gone, problem solved. No monster, just a stressed-out ranger imagining things. A week later, it struck again. A couple, newlyweds according to the news, vanished out on a hiking trail near my patrol route. The search this time was massive, helicopters whirling overhead. I was kept on the sidelines, the ranger equivalent of being grounded, but I couldn't stay away. The ranger in charge, Bennett his name was, let me tag along eventually. We followed a rough trail up the side of a densely forested ridge. Something caught my eye, a flash of bright color off the trail, tangled in the undergrowth. I pushed forward, ignoring Bennett's shouts behind me. It was the woman's necklace, a delicate gold chain. And there, snagged on a twisted branch, a scrap of blood-stained fabric. I felt a surge of nausea and rage. I'd seen enough. That night, I headed back towards Pelican Creek alone. My wife was furious, pleading with me to stop. It wasn't worth it, she said. I couldn't ignore them, not anymore. Not her. Not me. Something had to be done. The fog swirled again, thicker than ever. It barely even felt like night out there. I moved silently, shotgun cradled in my arms, the safety disengaged. Somewhere in the forest, I could swear I heard ragged breathing. I froze. Suddenly, I.D. launched out of the fog, a blur of dark fur and teeth. I fired, stumbled back. The shotgun roared, and the creature screamed again in pain, twisting and thrashing. I fired again. And again. Branches shattered, leaves fell like confetti. The creature howled, then staggered away, crashing back into the night. I stumbled after it, desperate to finish this. My flashlight beam cut through the fog, searching. There, half hidden under the drooping branches of a pine, was a crumpled form. I rushed forward, then froze in horror. It wasn't the creature. It was Bennett. His body was mangled, torn open, blood smeared across the bark. He'd taken the brunt of my terrified barrage. Bennett, who humored me, who'd followed my lead into an ambush. I fell to my knees. The shaking began, an uncontrollable tremor that racked my entire body. That was when I heard the laughter. It echoed from the darkness, a low mocking sound that chilled me more than any animal growl. My flashlight beam shook as I raised it, searching. There, at the edge of the light, stood the creature. A fresh wound on its massive side gleamed where my shots had landed. Its mouth was twisted in a terrible grin. I raised the shotgun again, but there was something in those fiery red eyes wasn't animal madness. It was cold intelligence, an almost human amusement. And with a terrifying certainty, I knew it understood. The creature turned, vanishing silently back into the fog. I stayed there, huddled beside Bennett's broken body, long after the sun rose, the mist clearing to reveal a scene of unspeakable horror. They found me near dawn, a babbling wreck clinging to the shotgun. The creature was never found, of course. My story got me put away, first in the hospital, then, when my babbling rants about monsters didn't subside, a different kind of place. They call it delusion, PTSD. And maybe it is. Maybe the creature was a figment of a stressed mind fueled by tragedy piled upon tragedy. But some nights, I hear that laughter from my window, 
and smelled the rank breath of the woods on the breeze. My wife, bless her, moved away from Yellowstone a year after. She couldn't handle it any more, the whispers, the crazy ranger looks. I don't blame her. My work now is keeping this place clean, sweeping floors, tending gardens. It's honest, quiet, safer for everyone. As far as anyone knows, those deaths in the park remain unsolved. Animals, maybe? Or a drifter gone mad? Some stories are better left buried. But I know. It's still out there. Sometimes, when that laughter echoes in the back of my mind, I almost hope it finds me. Because if I take the truth about Pelican Creek to the grave, then the creature wins. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in August of 1997. I've been a park ranger in Yosemite for almost a decade. It's tough work, but somebody has to protect these mountains. Grew up hiking with my old man in the Blue Ridge Mountains, so woods feel more like home than my actual place. The summer of 97 started normal enough chasing after kids trying to get too close to the waterfalls, putting out illegal campfires left by careless weekend tourists. You know the drill. Then came the reports, whispered at first. Hikers saying they felt watched at night, seeing odd shapes flitting past their tents, hearing those weird growls in the dead of night. I'd heard it all before, mostly overactive imaginations fueled by firelight, and too much cheap whiskey. Only this time, it kept happening. Two weeks later, a camper went missing. Just vanished. No body, no sign of a struggle. Only the campsite looking like they'd run off in a hurry. That's when things got serious. The higher-ups sent in a search party, but nothing. I stayed on the case, felt it in my gut something was off about this whole thing. My boss, grizzled veteran named Walker, finally told me to back off. It's a damn bear, Rowan. Or maybe a mountain lion. You're just spooked. I wasn't having it. Those tracks weren't any animal I recognized, and the way the campsite looked, it was calculated, not like a hungry predator, but something smarter. One night I was out patrolling alone checking the trails near Glacier Point. The air felt heavy, charged, and that prickling on the back of my neck that I'd learned to trust started up. I moved off trail, heading towards a creek where I sometimes spot deer. That's when I saw it. A pair of eyes, glowing red in the darkness, flickered behind a tree. Not animal eyes too high, and the wrong shape. Something massive shifted in the shadows. Before I could react, it stepped into the moonlight. God, I wish I hadn't seen it properly. It stood close to nine feet tall, its body a grotesque mix of human and animal. Muscular arms that ended in razor claws, a long muzzle filled with sharp teeth. Shaggy brown fur covered its body, but its face, that was the worst part. It had intelligence, a twisted sort of cunning that made my stomach turn. It stared at me, head cocked, then let loose a guttural snarl that sent shivers down my spine. I fumbled for my pistol and fired. It snarled and lunged, disappearing into the trees. I stumbled back, tripped, and scrambled away as it charged again. I heard the crashing of branches the sound of its feet pounding towards me, getting closer. The next thing I remember is waking up in the ranger station, Walker standing over me, face grim. No sign of the creature. He figured I'd tripped, hit my head. I tried to tell him what I saw, but he just looked at me with pity. Like I'd cracked. The rest of the summer is a blur. More people went missing, Search teams turning up empty-handed. 
Walker started keeping me off the night shifts, said it was too dangerous. I felt like I was going crazy, caught between trying to warn everyone and this bone-deep knowledge that no one would ever believe me. Then came the night that changed everything. I was doing a final patrol before clocking out when I saw a group of campers set up near Half Dome. A family looked like. It made my blood run cold. Whatever was out there, it was getting bolder. I ran towards their camp, waving my arms and yelling for them to pack up and leave. They just stared at me in confusion, probably figured I was some unhinged ranger. I started explaining about the creature, but that's when I saw the eyes. Two fiery orbs in the darkness behind their camper. One of the kids, a little girl, saw it too. She screamed. The thing burst out of the shadows, a blur of fur and teeth. I yelled at them, told them to run. I pulled my pistol and fired, the shots ringing out in the still night. I saw the creature flinch, a spray of blood, but it kept coming. The family scrambled, trying to flee into the woods, but the thing was too fast. Leaping with impossible agility, it latched onto the man, its claws ripping through his back. I screamed, firing wildly. One shot caught the creature in the shoulder, making it let out a howl and turn on me. I kept firing, moving in a frantic circle as it swiped at me with its claws, each swipe tearing the air and missing by inches. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see the woman grabbing her kids, making a break for the trees. I yelled for them to get the hell out of there, prayed they might escape into the darkness. The creature shifted focus, sniffing the air and turning in their direction. My heart hammered a desperate tattoo in my chest. I had to buy them time. I lunged forward, tackling the creature, wrestling it to the ground. The smell was overpowering, a mix of musk and rot. Its enormous weight pinned me down, those fiery eyes an inch from my face. I screamed into its muzzle, shoved my pistol up under its jaw, and pulled the trigger. There was a deafening explosion, followed by a wave of searing pain as its talons sliced into my shoulder. I screamed and squeezed my eyes shut, sure this was the end. Just when I thought I couldn't hold on any more, the weight on me lifted and the creature let loose an ear-splitting shriek of agony. I scrambled to my feet, clutching at my bloody shoulder. The creature staggered back, a gaping wound blasting smoke where its face had been. It thrashed and howled in pain, clawing at the air. My pistol lay useless on the ground. Then I saw them. The woman and her kids emerging from the tree line. They were safe. I stumbled back, tripped over a fallen log, and crashed to the dirt, my vision swimming. The sounds of the creature thrashing faded, replaced by the pounding of my own heart in my ears. Had it run off? Was it dead? Either way, I had to get out of there. Pulling myself up, my whole body trembling from adrenaline and shock, I started moving. Stumbling, Clutching at trees for support, I staggered away from the campsite. By the time I reached the ranger station, dawn was breaking. I collapsed into Walker's office, babbling my story. When he saw the blood, the claw marks slashing my arm, he finally seemed to believe, or at least believe I wasn't just some nut job. They found two bodies in what was left of the campsite, the father of the family and another ranger walker had sent out later in the night. There was never any sign of the creature again. They tried to say it was a rogue bear, but I knew better. Even Walker had a look in his eyes like maybe he'd seen something that night that changed his mind. In the weeks that followed, I became the park's resident expert on the Yosemite monster, if you can believe it. They moved me onto a desk job pushing around reports of missing squirrels and vandalized outhouses. I tried to protest, 
but nobody was really listening. That was nearly two years ago. Most nights I wake up screaming, drenched in sweat, the image of the creature burned into my mind. I don't sleep much anymore. A month ago, my wife walked out, said she couldn't handle it, couldn't live with the fear. Can't blame her, honestly. The creature stole a piece of me that night, something more basic than flesh. There's a darkness hanging around me, a sense that it isn't finished yet. Some days, when the fog sits heavy in the valley, and the trees seem to lean in too close, I get a prickling on the back of my neck. I catch a whiff of that putrid smell, hear a growl carried on the wind. The other rangers laugh at me when I say this, but I know, deep down, the creature is still out there, biding its time, maybe healing those wounds, or maybe just watching, waiting. I've started keeping the pistol under my pillow again. If it comes for me, it won't be a surprise this time. I'll fight it tooth and nail until the end, and maybe, if I'm lucky, take it with me. That's the best outcome I can hope for these days. They put a plaque up to honor the dead campers. Victim of a tragic bear attack, the inscription reads. I pass it sometimes, on my way to file those damn squirrel reports. Truth is, there are monsters out there far worse than any bear. People don't like hearing it, but it's the truth. I only pray that, one day, they'll believe someone before it's too late. My name is Eli Campbell, and this happened to me in October of 2010. I'd been a park ranger in the Grand Canyon National Park for just about all my life. Loved being out here. Grew up running around these rocks. Probably know them better than my own backyard. That fall, things started to feel off. Wasn't just the usual nonsense. Careless tourists snapping selfies too close to the edge. Usual stuff. No, it was something in the air a sense of wrongness hanging heavy over the canyon. Started with the whispers from other rangers, then from the hikers returning wide-eyed from the backcountry. Talk of strange noises at night, a feeling of being watched, the sense that something wasn't right out there. I didn't take it too seriously at first, chalked it up to overactive imaginations and folks getting spooked by the solitude. But then the disappearances started. Not a lot, mind you, just enough to put everyone on edge. One lone hiker here, a couple there. No trace left behind. The higher-ups claimed it was folks falling, getting lost in flash floods, the usual explanations. But something in my gut told me different. One afternoon, I was patrolling a stretch of the south rim when I noticed a set of tracks that set my teeth on edge. They weren't human, weren't from an animal I recognized. They were huge, each print the size of my face, and something about their gait suggested massive power. There was an odd intelligence to the way they were placed too, like whatever made them was sizing up the trail. I followed the tracks as long as I could before they disappeared down into the canyon depths. Went back to the station and tried to report it. But my supervisor, old Jimbo, just patted me on the shoulder. Too much sun, Eli, he chuckled. Figures. But I couldn't shake that feeling. Something was out there. Weeks turned into months, and the disappearances continued. I started taking hikes down the trails alone, searching for any sign of what was happening. One crisp morning in December, I found it. Deep in the canyon, I stumbled upon a cave tucked away in a side ravine. Inside, it smelled of rotten meat and something muskier, more primal. Littered across the floor were bones, animal, sure, but also, others. Too big and strangely shaped to be deer or elk. That's when I saw it, the creature, lurking in the cave's dark recesses. 
It must have been twelve feet tall, easily, its form a grotesque blend of man and beast. Massive shoulders covered in thick brown fur, claws like hunting knives at the end of long, muscular arms. But the worst part was its face. Like a bear's only warped, elongated, and its eyes, God, I'd never seen eyes like that. Deep crimson, burning with a chilling intelligence. For a moment, we just stared at each other, the silence broken only by my hammering pulse. Then it let out a guttural growl that echoed off the cave walls. I scrambled back, tripping over rocks, never taking my eyes off the creature as it slowly lumbered out of the shadows. I ran. Every instinct screamed at me to get out of that canyon. The creature was gaining fast. I could hear its ragged breath behind me. My heart threatened to burst from my chest, my legs burned with exertion. Just when I thought I couldn't take another step, I saw the trail above. I launched myself up the last stretch of rocky ascent, scrambling onto the path bathed in the fading afternoon light. I looked back at the canyon below. The creature had stopped at the edge of the tree line, and for a long, terrifying moment, our eyes met. Then, as if deciding I wasn't worth the chase, it turned and disappeared back into the shadows. I stumbled back to the station, babbling my story to a disbelieving Jimbo. He just shook his head, called me over to his old dusty computer to show me photos of black bears and sunstroke warnings. Said it was distress, all those missing person cases getting to me. He was wrong, of course. In the months after my encounter, the disappearances continued, the search teams turning up nothing. Some people suspected me, whispers following me around the park. Crazy Eli, they called me. Didn't much care. I knew what I saw. Still no. Sometimes, on long nights when the wind whispers through the canyon, I swear I can smell that cave again, hear those heavy footsteps in the dark. The creature's still out there. A month ago, they found Jimbo's body down one of the ravines, ripped apart. No official cause, of course, but I knew. The creature had finally come for him. People called it a freak accident, an animal attack. I said nothing. After all, who would believe me? My name is Ben Shepard, and this happened to me in September of 1994. I'm a National Park Ranger, stationed in the Appalachian Mountains, Blue Ridge Parkway to be exact. Been working these woods for longer than I care to remember. My old man was a ranger too, the best kind. I kind of grew up in these forests. That fall, things started to feel off. It started subtly, barely noticeable like a shift in the breeze. Rangers started reporting hikers going missing. No bodies, no sign of struggle, just vanished off the trails. They blamed folks getting lost, disoriented, but deep down, I felt there was something more. Like a chill wind coming from a place you couldn't see. Then came the stories from other rangers at night, out on patrol. They'd claim to hear footsteps in the underbrush when they were out alone, feel like they were being followed, despite the silence. One old-timer, a guy named Flynn, even said he swore he saw eyes, big, glowing yellow eyes peering back at him from the tree line, disappearing in a blink. The higher-ups laughed it off, stress, bad moonshine, usual dismissals. One evening... I was closing up a section of the parkway when I stumbled on it myself, the cause for all the unsettling stories. Deep in the woods, off a little-used maintenance trail, I found a clearing. And in the center of it, bones. Piles of them, gnawed and cracked. Deer, bear, sure, but something else mixed in. Bones too big, too oddly shaped. 
and scattered amongst the animal remains, torn bits of clothing, a mangled backpack. My heart pounded in my chest. This wasn't natural, not normal at all. Right then, my radio crackled with Flynn's voice, panicked. Said he was out on the trail, said he saw it, the thing that was making those eyes. Then the audio cut out. I ran, following the trail towards the spot he'd radioed in from. Every instinct told me to go back, get help. But Flynn had been like family, and my gut said he was in trouble. Night was falling fast when I reached the edge of the woods, peering into an overgrown meadow. And there, in the waning light, it stood. The creature. I couldn't make out all the details, but the sheer scale of it was enough to make my knees wobble. Close to ten feet tall, covered in matted fur that shimmered silver in the moonlight. Its arms were like tree trunks, its hands tipped with claws that ripped into the earth. And the head, that was worst. A mix of wolf and man, twisted and wrong, yellow eyes blazing. For a heartbeat, we just stood there, frozen. Then, it let out a roar that echoed through the mountains. The raw sound of fury and hunger. Flynn cried out from somewhere in the meadow, his voice filled with pain and terror. That snapped me into action. I charged forward, yelling, trying to draw the creature away. It turned, and in the dim light, its teeth flashed in a grotesque grin. I heard Flynn scream again, and the sound cut off abruptly. The creature turned back towards me, and for a second, I thought about running. But Flynn was out there, maybe even still alive, and that creature wasn't going to let me go without a fight. My heart was a drumbeat in my ears as I raised my rifle, more of an act of defiance than actual strategy. I hadn't even reloaded since firing warning shots at a mama bear a few weeks back. This thing, bullets wouldn't even slow it down. Yet I aimed. The creature stalked closer, its eyes fixated on me. I squeezed the trigger. The shot echoed, useless. It roared and lunged. I braced, then silence. My eyes flew open. The creature had stopped just feet in front of me, its massive form frozen in mid-pounce. Confused, I scrambled back, then noticed what had stopped it in its tracks. A flickering headlamp bobbing through the trees. Then a voice, gruff and familiar. Don't move. That thing hates light. It was old man Flynn. Battered and bleeding, but miraculously alive. He dragged himself into view, one hand clutching the headlamp, the other an old, heavy-duty flashlight. As he got closer, the creature hissed and retreated a few steps, its eyes narrowing against the concentrated beams. Keep those lights on it. Flynn croaked, his face pale. Come on, move! I didn't need telling twice. Stumbling to my feet, I shuffled towards Flynn. The creature watched, snarling, but the fearsome predator from before seemed held at bay by the harsh light, unable to approach. Flynn collapsed against the tree, and I knelt beside him. His leg was twisted at an unnatural angle, the bone jutting through torn skin. Hold this. He thrust the heavy flashlight at me. Aim it straight at that thing. With shaking hands, I took the flashlight. Its beams seemed to make the creature agitated, keeping it at a distance as I helped Flynn splint his leg, fashioning a makeshift support from branches. The whole time, we kept those lights trained on the predator, its snarls filling the night. When the makeshift splint was secured, Flynn slumped back, exhausted. They told me I was crazy, he rasped, a dark chuckle rasping in his throat. Said it was bears, wild cats, never believed they'd believe this. Suddenly, the creature charged again, a blur of dark fur and aggression. We both screamed, holding the light steady. It stopped short, 
as if hitting an invisible wall. Then it paced back and forth, watching us with calculating eyes. Can't hold it forever, Flynn muttered. Sun's coming up soon, but... He trailed off, grimacing. We both knew what that meant. We'd be sitting ducks come daylight. That's when I saw it the fire lookout tower flashing on a distant ridge, an old beacon hardly ever used anymore. Maybe, just maybe. I laid out my plan to Flynn, a desperate gamble at best. He nodded slowly, wincing as he shifted his injured leg. Crazy enough to work, he grunted. With Flynn providing cover, keeping the creature pinned with the flashlights, I crept backwards into the undergrowth. I had to get to the base of the tower, unseen, if this had any chance. Inch by painful inch, I moved, the creature pacing restlessly as it sensed me pulling away. Then I was free of its sightline, scrambling towards the tower on my belly. The base of the tower was an old metal shed, filled with outdated equipment and forgotten maps. Inside I struck gold flares. I grabbed them, heart pounding, then began the terrifying climb up the narrow ladder of the tower. The creature must have sensed the change of elevation because it roared in frustration, scrabbling against the base of the tower as I reached the top. I secured myself, heart in my throat, and fumbled with the flare. Flickering crimson light sparked to life, and with a prayer I hurled it down. The flare bounced off a rock near the creature and exploded. It screeched, recoiling from the blinding flash. Encouraged, I lit another and another, tossing them into the clearing. The creature thrashed and howled, clearly in pain from the sudden bursts of light. I didn't stop, my hands shaking as I fumbled for the last flare. And then, as dawn broke, the creature turned and fled, disappearing into the forest with astonishing speed. When the search team finally arrived, we told them the unbelievable truth. They found footprints larger than any bear, the clearing littered with bones. Whatever that creature was, it was still out there. The aftermath was a blur. Flynn recovered, though he walked with a limp for the rest of his days. I never saw the creature again but I feel it sometimes. A prickling at the back of my neck. That lingering sense of being watched from the encroaching darkness of the trees. We got transferred, both of us. Bad for morale, this kind of thing, the suit said, sweeping it all under the rug. I moved on, got a desk job pushing paper instead of patrolling trails safer, they said. Maybe. But sometimes, in the dead quiet of my office, I swear I can smell the rankness of the woods, hear the echoing roar, and feel the heat of those burning yellow eyes fixed on me in the deep, unending dark. My name is Mark Sloan and this happened to me in September of 1994. I've spent the better part of my life working as a park ranger. I started out in a smaller patch of forest, but eventually made it out to Olympic National Park in the Pacific Northwest. It's rugged territory filled with dense untouched forests, perfect for someone who craves a bit of solitude. Most of what we do involves light patrols, campsite maintenance, and the occasional bit of search and rescue when hikers get a bit too ambitious and lose their way. One crisp autumn morning, a call came in from dispatch. A group of teenagers had gone out on an unapproved overnight hike and failed to return on schedule. They'd been due back two days prior and hadn't checked in since venturing into the wilderness three days earlier. This wasn't uncommon, Cell signal is a fickle thing deep in the woods, so after initial contact is lost, we give them a couple of days in case they've just run into delays. But after waiting it out, it was time to go in. My partner at the time, 
a seasoned ranger named Ben Cooper, and I took on the case. They'd set out on a designated trail, but from what their parents told us, the group was prone to a bit of adventurous off-roading. It meant we weren't simply following a well-trodden path and hoping they were just lagging behind. We packed the standard gear emergency supplies, first aid, radios, and a couple of rifles, because you never truly know what you might encounter. Ben carried one, more for animal encounters than anything else, but even back then, I felt uneasy about having them. Still, it was protocol and easier to hike with it than get in trouble for not. The first day was uneventful. We moved fast, staying light. Our plan was to cover as much of the known route as possible, then begin a grid search in the areas where they were more likely to have strayed. We called out, whistled, and scanned for any sign of disturbance snapped branches, footprints that deviated from the trail. Nothing. As the sun began its descent, we made camp. Our conversations were a mix of practical discussions about the next day and idle talk about our families to pass the time. As the veteran, Ben regaled me with stories from his early ranger days. I'd been on the job long enough now to have a few myself. Crazy thing, once found a campsite that was totally torn apart. I mean tent ripped, sleeping bag shredded, gear tossed everywhere. No blood, though, that was the freaky part. We joked about the possibilities, a runaway bear, or even that ever-reliable Bigfoot theory. It helped distract from the unease that lingers in the back of the mind in cases like these. At nightfall, it's easy to let the shadows and the rustling of the trees play tricks on you. Just get some sleep, Mark. Tomorrow's gonna be a long haul. Ben cut through the tension hanging in the air. He was right. Rest, even a few hours of fitful sleep, was a necessity out here. But as I lay there, my mind fixated on those kids, out there somewhere, scared, hurt perhaps. That night, I dreamt of their voices, calling out for help amidst the towering trees. Day two followed a similar pattern to the first, slow, meticulous progress and no signs of them. The parents had mentioned a small, secluded lake that the group had been aiming for. It was a long shot, but we started angling our route in that direction. Yet, with each passing hour, the worry gnawed at me. The terrain had grown steeper, the forest thicker. Even with daylight filtering through the canopy, the area felt claustrophobic a maze of twisted branches and shadowed undergrowth. My eyes darted in every direction, a constant scan of the surroundings for anything amiss. The silence was heavy, punctuated only by the rhythmic crunch of our boots across fallen foliage. That was when Ben froze, raising his fist, the signal to halt. His eyes were fixed intently on a spot a few yards ahead. I followed his gaze, my rifle rising reflexively. There, amongst the tangled roots of a massive fir tree, lay a patch of disturbed earth, leaves kicked away and a single piece of bright fabric snagged on a branch. It was a scrap of vibrant blue, a mismatch with the muted tones favored by experienced hikers, further confirming this was no ordinary trek. Ben and I exchanged a silent look a shared understanding of what we were finding. This wasn't just a simple delay. Something had happened here. We split up, slowly circling the site, weapons at the ready. I found another piece of fabric, this time a fluorescent pink, then a tattered bandana pattern with cartoon characters, decidedly young. A few feet further, something glinted under a pile of leaves, half buried in the dirt. I crouched down, heart pounding, and dug it out, a smashed cell phone, its screen a spiderweb of cracks. Ben appeared at my side, his face grim. Keep an eye out for any other belongings, or... He didn't need to finish. We both knew what the unspoken, 
or meant discarded gear was one thing, but bloodstains or torn clothing would tell a very different, far more sinister story. The next hour passed in a tense blur. Each step forward felt like stepping into the unknown. We moved into radio silence, no point in risking our position being given away. My every sense was on high alert, straining for a misplaced sound, a glimpse of movement in the dense undergrowth. And then I saw it. Not the missing teens, but a trail of some kind, a narrow path cutting through the vegetation heading off the main path. It was subtle, easily missed by an untrained eye, but it was undeniably purposeful. Someone, or something, had passed this way repeatedly. I signaled to Ben, pointing at the faint track. We followed, our footsteps muted, our breathing shallow. The trail wound deeper into the forest. The sunlight dwindled, swallowed whole by the towering evergreens. We moved cautiously, eyes scanning ahead and behind, a creeping uneasiness settling upon us like a shroud. It was far too quiet, no birdsong, not even the usual rustle of small forest creatures. The air felt heavy, expectant, as though the whole forest was holding its breath. The path wound sharply, and suddenly we broke out into a small clearing. It looked ordinary enough, a patch of flattened earth, some overgrown bushes circling it. But something about it set my teeth on edge, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck. Ben held up his hand, his expression tight. He pointed towards the far end of the clearing. I followed his gaze and froze. There stood a crude structure, a lean-to built of branches lashed together with vines. Its opening gaped at us like a ragged mouth. Strewn on the ground in front of it was a pile of belongings. Backpacks, torn and stained with something dark. A sleeping bag, ripped open. And scattered amongst the debris, flashes of bone, starkly white against the dim forest floor. Every instinct screamed at me to run. But before I could move, before I could even process the horror unfolding before me, a shadow detached itself from the edge of the clearing. It was immense. Hulking. A silhouette of tangled limbs and matted fur that towered well over seven feet tall. Its eyes, glinting in the dim light, were utterly inhuman, pools of pure darkness. A low, guttural growl rumbled from deep within its chest. Time seemed to stretch out, each second a heavy weight dragging me downwards. Ben's shout, a desperate warning, snapped me out of my paralysis. I raised my rifle, more on instinct than any clear plan. It let out a roar, a primal sound that shook the very leaves on the trees. Ben was already moving, yelling for me to follow. We sprinted back into the trees, the creature's roar echoing behind us. The adrenaline coursing through my veins blocked out any rational thought. There was only direction away. We stumbled through the dense foliage, the undergrowth tearing at our clothes and scratching our exposed skin. Branches whipped against our faces, and roots snagged at our feet. My lungs burned, and my legs throbbed in protest, but fear propelled me forward. I could hear the creature behind us its heavy footfalls and guttural snarls keeping our pace frantic. Ben's voice broke through the panicked haze. Split up! Divide and confuse! He veered sharply to the left, and I obeyed, cutting right. I could still hear him, gasping and crashing through the undergrowth, his presence a perverse comfort amidst the chaos. I didn't know how long I ran. Time warped blending into a nightmarish blur of pounding heartbeats and ragged breaths. At some point, I stumbled and fell hard. Pain exploded in my knee, but I lurched back to my feet, ignoring the white-hot agony. Finally, gasping and drenched in sweat, I burst out of the thickest of the forest and found myself on a familiar path. 
one of the secondary trails. It was a lifeline, a thin thread of sanity in this all-encompassing madness. I ran, no longer thinking of direction, simply driven by the need to put distance between myself and that, that thing in the woods. I don't know how long it took me to reach the ranger station. I remember a blur of faces, frantic voices, and a whirlwind of urgent questions. Ben never came out of those woods. The next few days are a haze. A search team scoured the forest, the scale of the operation growing with each passing hour. Teams armed with hunting rifles, helicopters, and even a contingent of National Guard soldiers joined the search. They found more. Trails leading deeper into the heart of the forest. Small, hidden clearings littered with debris and the gnawed bones of animals, deer, raccoons, maybe even the remains of the occasional lost hiker. But there was no trace of Ben, and horrifyingly, no sign of the creature either. It was as if it had vanished. The official explanation was an animal attack. A bear, possibly a rogue cougar. It was a flimsy explanation and everyone knew it, but it was easier than the alternative. Even I held on to the desperate hope that maybe, just maybe, Ben was still alive, lost, injured, but somewhere out there. For weeks afterward, I couldn't go back into the woods. The creak of floorboards in my own home would send me leaping to my feet, my heart pounding. Even in the safety of my living room, surrounded by familiar things, I was haunted by the echo of its roar, the image of its inhuman eyes seared into my memory. They eventually forced me to take time off. Counseling At first, I resisted. If I wasn't actively doing something to find Ben, then what was the point? But with time, the futility, the sheer hopelessness of it all sank in. I never went back to being a ranger. Couldn't face setting foot in the wilderness again. The city felt wrong, cramped, stifling, but it was also safe. Predictable. No unexplained disappearances. No lurking shadows at the edge of the tree line. I'd see reports in the news sometimes. Sporadic disappearances in national parks across the country. Sightings of strange creatures. Never clear photos. Never any real proof. But I knew. They never found Ben's body. And they never found that thing. Whatever it was. And sometimes, at night... When the shadows lay thick and the wind whispers through the window panes, I swear I can still hear that guttural roar echoing through the deepest, darkest part of my memory. The aftermath was swift and brutal. Olympic National Park was shut down indefinitely. Trails were sealed, warnings plastered at every potential entrance. It became a ghost land, a vast expanse of wilderness deemed too dangerous to tread. Hikers and nature lovers cried foul, petitions circulated, but ultimately, the government stood firm. Too many disappearances, too much inexplicable evidence, and no viable explanation to offer the public. The story spiraled into legend. Conspiracy theories filled the void cryptid hunters railed against government cover-ups. The paranormal community declared it a portal to another dimension. The creature became a boogeyman, a campfire story swapped by adrenaline-seeking thrill-chasers and wide-eyed children alike. For me, there was no legend, no mystery. Only a cold certainty of what lurked out there, a brutal truth that clawed at my sanity. I became a recluse, avoiding the news, wary of crowds. Each face became a blur, a potential mask hiding the eyes of a monster. Years turned into a decade, then two. Time, supposed to be a healer, did little to dull the sharp edges of loss and trauma. The world moved on. Ben's family moved on, as best they could. I never did. One late summer afternoon, driven by a desperate restlessness, 
I found myself on the outskirts of the park. There was a barricade, of course, weathered and tagged with graffiti, yet as impregnable as the day it had been erected. I lingered, staring into the dense mass of green beyond, my fingers tracing the rough outline of the missing person poster that still fluttered faintly from the weathered wood a picture of Ben, smiling, his eyes alive in a way mine hadn't been in years. They say the forest calls to you. It does. It's both a whisper and a roar, inviting and threatening all at once. I turned away, knowing I would heed that call again, and again, always haunted by the choice I made that day, to run and survive, leaving Ben to a fate swallowed whole by the wilderness. My name is Lucas Warren, and this happened to me in October of 2010. I was working as a ranger in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, been at it for a few years by then. Grew up round these parts, always felt at home in the woods. Sure, there are the usual hazards, bears, unpredictable weather, the occasional reckless hiker, but those had become routine risks to manage. It was early fall, and a couple of buddies, Dylan and Ryan, had come up to visit. We were all experienced hikers and had planned a multi-day trek along the Appalachian Trail. Nothing too extreme, just the three of us, a chance to unwind and catch up. You bring protection? Ryan had asked as we were packing. Of course, I scoffed, flashing the rifle slung over my shoulder. Mostly for show, never actually had to use it. We hit the trailhead mid-morning. The sky was clear, not a hint of the sudden storms the Smokies were known for. We set a brisk pace, the familiar rhythm of footsteps and easy chatter a welcome soundtrack. Dylan, the photographer of the group, darted around, snapping pictures of weathered signposts and bursts of colorful mushrooms peeking through fallen leaves. Slow down! We've got all the time in the world. I ribbed him, though I couldn't help but smile at his enthusiasm. That afternoon, we came across an odd sight, a campsite clearly abandoned in a hurry. The tent was half collapsed, sleeping bags unrolled as if someone had bolted mid-setup. A half-eaten energy bar lay near an open backpack. No signs of violence, just a weird, uneasy feeling about the whole thing. They probably just bailed when they saw the weather report. Ryan shrugged, ever the voice of reason. But it didn't sit right with me. Experienced campers don't just up and vanish. We opted to push on figuring we'd report the abandoned campsite to the backcountry office in the morning. After another mile or so, we found a clearing and made camp for the night. It was a quiet evening. We cooked over a small fire, recounted old stories, and the usual good-natured ribbing. As night fell, the sense of unease lingered, a prickling at the back of my neck I couldn't shake. The chill woke me up sometime in the early hours of the morning. I lay still, senses on high alert. It wasn't the cold that had roused me. There was a rustling outside the tent, too rhythmic to be just the wind. Dylan stirred beside me, muttering sleepily. Something's out there, I whispered. His eyes shot open. We laid motionless, straining to hear over the thumping of my pulse. There it was again, a low, guttural growl. It made the hair on my arms stand on end. It was no bear, or at least, no bear I'd ever encountered. Next to me, Dylan fumbled for his phone, his fingers shaking. My hand tightened around the hunting knife at my hip. It felt comically inadequate. Ryan had unzipped the tent flap his head poking out as he scanned the darkness. Lucas, what the... He froze, and with a sickening jolt, I knew why. 
two piercing yellow eyes gleamed back at us from just beyond the firelight. They blinked, slow and deliberate, before vanishing into the blackness. Get back in! I hissed, but it was too late. Ryan was on his feet, scrambling backward in a panic. With a roar that sent chills down my spine, the creature emerged from the darkness. It was massive, a towering figure of matted fur and impossibly long limbs, moving with a fluid, terrifying grace. Its eyes, those inhuman, glowing eyes, were fixed on us. The rifle! I yelled at Ryan, but his face was a mask of terror. Another roar, deafening this time, and the creature lunged. I shoved Ryan back inside the tent, fumbling for the rifle with shaking hands. I barely raised it before the creature's claws ripped through the thin nylon, the swipe narrowly missing my face. Dylan screamed, a high-pitched desperate sound cut abruptly short. From inside the tent came the sound of tearing fabric, frenzied snarls, and gut-wrenching thumps I'll never be able to forget. My rifle, useless now, clattered to the ground. Every survival instinct in me screamed to flee. Ryan was already tearing off into the darkness, his cries growing fainter. And beneath it all, Dylan's awful silence. I turned and ran, the creature's roar echoing behind me. It didn't pursue, perhaps deterred by the remnants of the fire, perhaps savoring its catch. I ran blind, branches whipping my face, my boots sinking into the mushy forest floor. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs buckled beneath me. Only then, gasping for breath and soaked in cold sweat, did I dare to stop. Lost, alone, and hunted. The realization hit me like a physical blow. I hunkered down in the undergrowth, heart drumming a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Around me, the once familiar woods seemed hostile, teeming with unseen horrors. With every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, I flinched, half expecting those glowing eyes to pierce the gloom. The first rays of dawn painted the forest in an eerie gray light. I moved then, stumbling through the trees in the vague direction of the trail. If I was lucky, I might reach the ranger station by nightfall. If I was lucky, something shifted just ahead a flicker of movement in the dense foliage. My battered muscles tensed, ready to run, to fight, to do anything but stand frozen in place. A weathered park signpost emerged from the tangle of branches. I'd stumbled across a lesser-known backcountry trail. My ragged breath turned into a sob of relief. I wasn't hopelessly lost. But still, that sense of being watched lingered. I forced myself to move faster, to not look back. It was hours later when I broke free of the tree lean, the sight of the ranger station a beacon of hope. I burst through the doors, my mud-caked clothing and wild eyes drawing startled looks. The tail spilled out in a jumbled rush the creature, Dylan Ryan. Search and rescue teams were sent out within the hour. They scoured the woods for days. No trace of Ryan was ever found. No trace of Dylan, except for a scrap of blood-stained blue fabric snagged on a branch near the campsite. And what the search team did find, well, they were tight-lipped about it. Only said it confirmed my story, confirmed what I already knew with bone-deep certainty. My name is Talia Novak, and this happened to me in September of 2016. I've been with the National Park Service nearly a decade. Started out in Zion National Park with all its red rock and scorching heat. But a couple of years back, I transferred to Olympic National Forest in Washington. Love the deep green, the rain, the quiet of the old-growth forests. 
Most of the job is mundane, trail maintenance, radioing and supply requests, and the occasional chat with overenthusiastic campers about fire safety. Sometimes, when the weather turns bad, there's search and rescue for lost hikers. But what happened a few falls back? Well, there's no training manual for that. It began with the reports. Hikers returning with wild stories, odd sounds in the night, a sense of being watched, glimpses of hulking figures just beyond the tree line. At first, it's easy to dismiss. Tired minds playing tricks in the dense forest. But after the third, fourth, fifth report with near-identical details, that uneasy feeling starts gnawing at you. The incident that set everything off involved a family, the Campbells. Two parents, three kids, the usual overloaded backpacks and bickering over trail mix. They got a late start on a planned three-day loop, figured they could make it through before a forecasted storm rolled in. They never made it out. When they were two days overdue, their emergency beacon still silent, my partner, Ethan, and I were sent to find them. We hiked their planned route, scouring the woods. On the morning of the third day, we stumbled upon their campsite. Or what was left of it. The tent looked like it had been torn apart by a wild animal, belongings scattered across the forest floor. No blood, that was the odd part but something else sent shivers down my spine. We found footprints, huge things, far larger than any human foot, and claw marks gouged into the bark of a nearby tree. Right then, I knew with chilling certainty, the hiker reports weren't drunken ramblings or overactive imaginations. Our calls for the Campbell family went unanswered. We tracked their trail deeper into the woods, Ethan's rifle at the ready. With every step, that sense of unease grew stronger, a prickling at the back of my neck. We weren't alone out here. By mid-afternoon, the rain began, a light drizzle at first, then steadily growing heavier. Visibility worsened, the thick canopy of leaves overhead reducing the daylight to an eerie twilight. We pushed on, the only sound the rhythmic crunch of our boots on the sodden earth and the relentless drum of the rain. Then we heard it, a low growl echoing through the trees. The hair on my arm stood on end. Ethan and I exchanged a look, a silent question hanging in the air. We moved closer, rifles raised, our senses on high alert. The growl came again, louder this time, followed by the crashing of undergrowth just ahead. We froze, straining to see through the gloom. Then, it emerged from the mist-shrouded forest. It was huge, a towering mass of muscle and tangled dark fur. Its height was impossible, at least eight feet even when hunched. It moved with unnatural fluidity, long limbs stretching the ground it covered with each terrifying stride. But it was the eyes that haunted me, burning yellow orbs, devoid of any warmth or animal recognition. They focused on us, and a primal sort of terror seized me. Easy, easy, I whispered to Ethan, though we both knew it was pointless. This wasn't a bear, or a cougar gone rogue. This was something else. Something old, and unnatural. Its lips peeled back in a snarl, revealing rows of jagged teeth far too long for any animal I knew. And then it charged. We fired both of us, the sound of the shots deafening in the rain-soaked forest. The creature let out a roar that shook the very trees, the sound both guttural and filled with an unsettling, chilling intelligence. One of the bullets seemed to make contact, the creature stumbling slightly, but it didn't stop its advance. Ethan yelled for me to run. I didn't need telling twice. Panic fueled my flight. Branches slapped at my face, roots snagged at my feet, but I kept moving, propelled by blind terror. The sound of the creature crashing through the forest behind me only spurred me on. I could hear Ethan's shouts, 
growing fainter. He'd been buying me time. I stumbled out onto a narrow dirt road, a stroke of pure luck. A truck rumbled past, and I flagged it down frantically. The driver, a grizzled logging foreman, stared at me, wild-eyed and covered in mud, but he didn't hesitate. He hauled me into the cab, and we sped off, the sound of the downpour pounding on the roof. I reported everything back at the ranger station. Official accounts put it down as an animal attack. Ethan's body was never found, swallowed whole by the wilderness. They offered me counseling time off, but I just wanted back out there. It didn't make sense, I knew that. But the thought of that creature still roaming free, lurking in the shadows of the forest, set a cold fire in my belly. They won't let me go back alone. My new partner, Jackson, is green. Keeps a wary eye on me, like I'm one step away from snapping completely. He's not wrong. I catch myself scanning the trees every time we're out on patrol, studying animal tracks for any sign of those impossibly large footprints, listening for any hint of that chilling, guttural growl. Weeks turned into months, and the constant vigilance wore me down. Every creak in my cabin at night sent jolts of terror through me. I'd wake gasping for air, convinced its monstrous yellow eyes were staring in through the window. Jackson noticed the change, the dark circles under my eyes, the way I flinched at every sudden sound. He was a good guy, trying his best within the confines of standard procedure. But we both knew there was no procedure for what we'd seen out there. Then came the whispers, carried on the wind by other hikers, hunters, and those who lived on the fringes of the forest. Sightings of a giant, shadowy figure, reports of livestock being torn apart, and eerie howls piercing the night air. The official explanation remained, wild animal, likely a rogue bear. The local papers picked up the story, fueling speculation and fear that simmered just beneath the surface of normalcy. I sought out those who had similar tales. A grizzled, old hunter who claimed to have seen it from his tree stand, a backpacker whose friend vanished during a night hike, their bodies never found. We became an unofficial society, bound by a shared trauma nobody else truly understood. We kept records, map sightings, poured over old folklore, desperate for any clue as to what we were up against. One moonless night, driven by a mix of recklessness and desperation, I ventured back into the woods alone. Armed with my rifle, a hunting knife that felt pathetically small, and a battered flashlight, I returned to the clearing where we'd first encountered the creature. The rain-washed ground showed no trace of the struggle, but the memory was burned into my mind with a brutal clarity. Talia? What the hell are you doing out here? Jackson's voice cracked through the darkness, laced with an odd mix of anger and fear. He must have been following me. The thought brought a flicker of warmth amidst the gnawing tension. Had to see it for myself, I said, keeping my voice steady. Needed to be sure I wasn't going crazy. He didn't reply, but I heard him moving closer, the rustle of leaves under his boots. We stood there in silence, the air thick with unspoken understanding and the lurking presence of the forest. Then the growl. Deep, rumbling, echoing through the trees. I spun, raising my rifle, but the darkness was impenetrable. My flashlight beam cut a swathe across the damp undergrowth revealing nothing. It's circling us, Jackson whispered, his voice tight. We moved back to back, scanning the impenetrable shadows, the silence broken only by our ragged breaths and the frantic pounding of our hearts. Minutes stretched into eternity. We held our position, waiting for the inevitable attack. But then, the growl faded, swallowed by the oppressive silence of the woods. It was gone, at least for now. 
We retreated back to my cabin, a wordless agreement settling between us. The unspoken question lingered in the air what did we do now? In the harsh light of my living room, surrounded by familiar objects and the normalcy I'd clung to, there were only two options stay and fight or turn and run. We chose to fight. The next few weeks were a blur of planning, preparation, and defiance against the bureaucratic red tape that threatened to smother any action. We reached out to our network of believers, gathering them in my shadowy cabin, the hunter, the backpacker, a local woman steeped in indigenous lore. We pooled our knowledge, our theories, and our fears. The creature, we came to realize, wasn't merely a predator. It was intelligent, cunning. The missing persons, the torn livestock, it was marking territory, driving fear into the hearts of those who dared tread within its domain. And if we didn't act, its territory, and its reign of terror, would only grow. We made a plan, a reckless, desperate plan born out of a shared unspoken acceptance that we might not all survive this. Our ragtag group, armed with hunting rifles, old knives, and a fierce determination, set out into the heart of the encroaching darkness. The forest felt different this time. Not only alive, but hostile, aware of our presence. We followed where the sightings led, where the creature had left its monstrous footprints and haunting growls. Each step was a calculated risk, each rustle of leaves a potential ambush. The confrontation, when it finally came, was both terrifying and anticlimactic. It emerged from the dense fog, its hulking form dwarfing us all. Its eyes gleamed with that same chilling light fixing on us with what felt like malevolent intent. We fired. The shots rang out in the clearing, a staccato of defiance. The creature let out a roar that rattled the leaves, but it didn't fall. It lurched forward, a wounded, enraged beast, but also something more. There was a flicker in its eyes, something akin to surprise, perhaps even a tinge of fear. It turned then, not in retreat, but in a tactical maneuver I recognized from countless nature documentaries. It wasn't alone. Two more figures materialized from the mist, just as large, just as monstrous. That was our breaking point. Outnumbered and outgunned, we ran. The aftermath was swift and brutal. The park was closed indefinitely. Government agents descended, silencing witnesses, sanitizing accounts. Our group scattered, forced back into the shadows. We became the whispered legend, the crazy park rangers who saw monsters in the woods. Jackson vanished. Some say he left the country. Others swear they've seen him venturing back to the edge of the woods, eyes fixed on the tree lean. I'm still here. My cabin feels less like a sanctuary, and more like a cage within a vast, encroaching wilderness. The creature, or creatures, haven't been seen in some time. The official word is that the threat is gone, but I know better. Sometimes at night, when the trees creak and groan in the wind, I think I hear the echo of that blood-curdling roar. I keep my rifle loaded, waiting. Because out there, in the deepest, darkest corners of the forest— the boundary has shifted. We are no longer the undisputed apex predators. And the uneasy truce between man and nature has shattered, leaving an untamed, monstrous wilderness, and those who dare to walk its shadowed paths, forever changed. My name is Kieran Finley, and this happened to me in August of 2002. Been working as a ranger in the Adirondack Park for most of my adult life. It's hard not to fall in love with the place, the tangled green mountains, the lakes like mirrors under the vast sky. Sure, you get the occasional bear encounter, 
maybe a lost hiker every now and then, but nothing the standard training doesn't prepare you for. Nothing like this. It started with the Wallace family. Two parents, three kids, and a golden retriever that was more enthusiasm than brains. They booked a cabin for a week, planning to do some light hiking, fishing, the usual wholesome family fun. When they didn't check out as scheduled, a routine search was put into motion. My partner Ben and I were assigned their route, a short loop trail around a particularly scenic lake, nothing that would usually cause trouble. By the time we reached the trailhead, though, that familiar prickle of unease crawled up my spine. The Wallace's minivan was still parked at the lot, looking oddly out of place amidst the towering pines. The golden retriever sat in the back, staring out with a mournful whine. Something feels wrong, Ben muttered, echoing my own thoughts. We split up to search the surrounding area, combing through the brush with a growing sense of dread. That was when I found her. The youngest Wallace kid, a girl, maybe seven or eight years old. She was half hidden beneath a pile of leaves, her face pale and tear streaked. I called out to Ben, dropping to my knees beside her. At first, she just whimpered, clutching a tattered stuffed rabbit. Then, her words spilled out in a panicked rush. The monster, it took them, in the trees. Her voice trailed off into a sob. I questioned her, gently but urgently. The story came out piecemeal, a jumbled tale of shadows in the woods, guttural noises, and the heart-wrenching screams of her family as they were dragged into the undergrowth. Her description was vague, filtered through the eyes of a terrified child, but two words stuck out, big, and furry. Ben joined us, his face grim. We radioed for backup, securing the area. There was no trace of the rest of the Wallace family, not a scrap of clothing or a single drop of blood. It was as though they'd vanished into thin air. The aftermath was a mess. The official explanation was a bear attack, but the complete lack of evidence, coupled with the child's terrified account, churned the rumor mill. Stories spread among the locals, hushed whispers about a creature lurking in the woods. I dismissed the talk at first. But that flicker of doubt, it had taken root in the pit of my stomach. There was no logical explanation for what happened to the Wallace family, and that left the door open to the impossible. My next patrol after that was different. Every snap of a twig made me jump. I scanned the tree line, half expecting to see a hulking shape watching me from the shadows. Ben noticed the change in me, the tension I couldn't shake. He chalked it up to the stress of the case but he also started watching the woods a little more warily. One afternoon, we stumbled across something that made our blood run cold. Tracks imprinted in the soft earth beside a creek. They were huge, far larger than any bear print I'd ever seen, with long, curved claw marks gouging deep into the mud. And there was something else, something chillingly familiar in their inhuman, vaguely bipedal shape. We radioed for a forensics team, but by the time they arrived, a heavy rainfall had washed away the tracks. The photos and plaster casts ended up locked away in a filing cabinet somewhere, labeled inconclusive. Officially, the case of the Wallace family went cold, but Ben and I, we weren't so sure anymore. We started taking patrols together refusing to be caught out alone with whatever was lurking in those woods. We kept an eye on the local chatter, listening for any sightings or missing person reports that fit the emerging pattern, people vanishing without a trace near the forest edge. One gray, drizzly morning, news came of another disappearance. A lone hiker, Joe Carter, an experienced outdoorsman with a penchant for going off trail, hadn't been heard from for days. 
His old, beat-up truck was still parked at a trailhead in a remote section of the park. We were the ones who found him, or at least, what was left of him. He was high up in the branches of a massive oak tree, his body mangled and torn as though some impossibly strong animal had pulled him apart. The sight turned my stomach. This wasn't a bear or a mountain lion. This was something different, something brutal and merciless. We reported our findings, our voices flat and devoid of anything resembling professional detachment. They tried to explain it away, a freak accident, maybe Joe fell and got caught in the branches. But Ben and I, we knew. The same creature that had taken the Wallace family was still out there. It was hunting. It couldn't go on. Whatever this thing was, it was getting bolder, taking prey closer to populated areas. We filed a report with the higher-ups, outlining every odd case, the unsettling tracks, the whispers, and the growing body count. I think they humored us, or maybe they wrote us off as two rangers traumatized by the Wallace incident. Either way, they denied our request for additional resources and a full-scale search. No creature, no threat, no action. We decided to take matters into our own hands. Armed with hunting rifles and a cold, desperate fury, Ben and I went back into the woods. We followed the fragmented trail of disappearances, mapping out a rough perimeter for the creature's territory. The deeper we went, the more the forest felt oppressive. It was too silent, even the bird song eerily absent, as though the wilderness itself was holding its breath. And then we saw it, a hulking shape, half obscured by the tangled undergrowth, moving with a terrifying grace. It dwarfed the surrounding trees, a monstrous silhouette of ragged fur and gleaming yellow eyes. For a frozen second, we could only stare, our minds grappling with the sheer scale and impossible reality of this thing. Snap out of it, Ben hissed, and his voice cut through my shock. The creature was stalking towards us, a low growl rumbling deep in its chest. We raised our rifles, but my hands trembled. This was no animal I recognized. Logic and training crumbled in the face of its sheer unnaturalness. It lunged, a blur of claws, teeth, and rage. Ben fired first, his bullet finding purchase with a solid thunk. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound that sent shivers down my spine. I fired too, more out of panic than precision, but the shots seemed to have little effect. It faltered, but only for a moment. Then, it was on us. Ben was my shield. I saw him grapple with the creature, his rifle knocked aside. His scream was short, cut abruptly as the creature's massive claws slammed into him, sending his body flying like a ragdoll. He landed with a sickening thud, his body crumpling at a grotesque angle. Ben! The name tore from my throat. Blind fury replaced the fear, and I fired at the creature, emptying my rifle with desperate abandon. It finally crumpled to the ground, its guttural growls fading into ragged gasps. I stumbled over to Ben. He couldn't answer, his eyes wide and filled with both pain and a terrible understanding. I pressed my hands to the gaping wound in his side, a futile attempt to stop the relentless flow of blood. He let out a strangled laugh, then coughed, crimson flecking his lips. Guess, guess the stories were true after all, he rasped out, his gaze fixed on the unmoving form of the creature. I wanted to deny it, to tell him we'd get him out of here, that everything would be all right. But the lies died on my tongue. There was no help coming, not in time to save him not in time to save any of us from the chilling knowledge that we were no longer at the top of the food chain. With trembling hands, I reloaded my rifle. The creature was still alive, its breathing labored. 
There was a flicker of dark awareness in its yellow eyes as it watched me. It knew, as we did, that this was far from over. I raised the rifle, a grim finality settling over me. The report of the gunshot echoed into a terrible silence. Ben closed his eyes, a single tear escaping the corner. I stood above him, the rifle clutched in my numb hands, and waited. The forest closed in around the clearing, holding its breath for whatever would emerge next. I didn't wait for backup. The next morning, battered and exhausted, I stumbled into the ranger station, my report a garbled jumble of half-truths and the grim reality that would never make it into any official record. I don't know if they believed me, don't know if they simply thought grief and trauma had broken me. Either way, I was quietly shuffled off to mandatory counseling and desk duty. No one spoke of Ben or the creature in the woods. His death was just another ranger lost to the wilderness. A year later, I quit the service. Couldn't face the trees the same way, the comforting familiarity replaced by a lurking dread. I couldn't forget the creature, its impossible size and those knowing, malevolent eyes. They said it was PTSD, the haunting echoes of that day in the clearing. Maybe it was. I moved to the city, trying to find solace in the anonymity of crowds, the relentless drone of traffic erasing the eerie silence of the forest. It helps most days. But there are nights when I wake gasping for air, the echo of that chilling roar ringing in my ears, my eyes wide in the darkness as I search for the monstrous shape lurking just beyond the window. The truth, the terrifying, impossible truth, has become my solitary burden. I saw the creature, tracked it, watched as it slaughtered those unlucky enough to cross its path. I fought it, and I lost. The Adirondack Park still looks the same on a map a sprawling expanse of green amidst the bustle of the northeast. But I know what lurks in its deepest, most ancient depths. They try to write it off, dismiss the missing persons, the whispered tales, blame it on bears, explain it away with convenient half-truths. But those of us who've seen it, we know better. Some nights, I think about going back. There's a kind of grim satisfaction in the idea of facing down the monster, of going down fighting instead of cowering on the fringes of civilization. I keep a hunting rifle stashed in my closet, a constant reminder of the unfinished business out there. One day, maybe, I'll return to the forest. Not as a ranger, bound by protocols and bureaucracy, but as a hunter. Or perhaps, as prey. The thought sends a jolt through me, a twisted mix of terror and grim determination. There are battles fought outside the realm of official reports, monstrous truths that lurk in the hidden corners of the world. When I face the creature again, it won't be on their terms. It'll be on mine. Until then, I walk the city streets, another face swallowed by the urban sprawl. I look normal, unremarkable the same as any other passerby. But beneath the surface, I'm the harbinger of a chilling truth, the battle-scarred veteran of a silent war humans were never meant to wage. They can close the parks, silence the stories, and try to sweep it all under the rug of normalcy. But the creature is still out there. And deep down, a part of me knows, this isn't over. My name is Callie Simmons, and this happened to me in October of 2011. I've been with the National Park Service for a few years now, and I still get that wide-eyed wonder when I'm deep in the woods. I chose Redwood National Park specifically, who doesn't love the giant trees. Something about them makes you feel small and ancient all at once. Most days, it's peaceful the usual ranger stuff of maintaining trails, the occasional lost hiker, 
ecological surveys. It all started with the Richardsons. Mom, Dad, two teenage kids, your typical American family, here to take over posed selfies and get some mild exercise on a designated trail. Only, they never made it to the trail's end. Initially, it seemed routine. Delayed by a flat tire, maybe wandered a bit off the path. Two days turned into five, and the search expanded. No trace, not a backpack or an energy bar wrapper, nothing. I was part of the expanded search crew. You'd get used to a certain kind of desolation in the wilderness, the vastness that can swallow you whole. That week, it was different. The woods felt heavy, watchful, like they were holding their breath. We spent days combing through the thick undergrowth and scanning the towering treetops, our calls echoing unanswered against the ancient trunks of the redwoods. And that's when the whispers started. Other searchers, muttering about odd sounds, movement just out of sight, and a chilling feeling of being watched. Old habits die hard. I chalked it up to exhaustion and nerves fraying under the pressure. But then came the Avery incident. Avery was my partner, a seasoned ranger with a steady hand and a dry sense of humor. Solid, the kind of person you'd want at your side in a crisis. We split up to cover more ground. Hours later, his panicked voice crackled over the radio. Callie! Something's here. It's huge. Oh, God. His cry was cut short by a chilling inhuman snarl and the abrupt silence of a dead radio. I sprinted through the trees, guided by the terror in his last transmission. The forest closed in around me, the redwoods seeming to block out the late afternoon sun, casting the area in an eerie twilight. When I found him, or what was left of him, the full horror of the situation hit me with bone-jarring clarity. Avery wasn't torn apart like a bear attack. His body had been disassembled. His limbs were wrenched away at impossible angles, his shattered bones jutting obscenely through his shredded uniform. And everywhere was blood, splattered across the ferns and up the bark of the trees like some macabre artwork. I gagged, but forced myself to examine the scene. There were tracks pressed into the soft earth, far too large for any bear or cougar, clawed and vaguely humanoid in their shape. Officially, they listed Avery's death as an animal attack, some freak of nature we'd never documented before. But I knew. We all knew. Something was lurking out there, hunting us. In the weeks that followed, an unspoken agreement settled over our camp. We moved in groups, armed with rifles and a lingering dread that settled beneath our ribs. There were more disappearances, a pair of college students from a nearby campsite, a lone conservation officer who ventured off the beaten path. Each time, we'd find nothing but those massive footprints and the same gruesome spatter of blood. Then it was my turn. I was with a crew marking trees for ecological surveys when I saw it. A flash of movement out of the corner of my eye, a towering silhouette disappearing behind a tangle of ferns. And that's when the forest seemed to explode into chaos. My team scattered, their shouts echoing through the trees. I saw a blur of matted, dark fur, and then something slammed into me, sending me sprawling to the ground. The force of the impact knocked the breath from my lungs. I scrambled backwards, fumbling for my rifle, but the figure was already looming over me. Everything about it was wrong. It stood at least eight feet tall, even hunched over. Its arms were impossibly long, ending in wicked claws, its head a grotesque mix of human and animal, all teeth and gleaming yellow eyes. Its breath washed over me in a fetid wave, a rotting neat smell that twisted my stomach. I fired, sheer panic outweighing precision. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound that made the ground beneath me tremble. It stumbled but didn't go down. 
I fired again, and then it was on me, claws raking across my arm. Pain exploded, white-hot agony that made me scream. Through a haze of pain and terror, I saw the others, rifles raised. They fired a desperate volley of shots. The creature let out another roar, swiped a massive paw at them, then vanished into the trees with shocking speed. They found me near an old, gnarled redwood, half delirious and bleeding profusely. The emergency evac was a blur, and I have only fragmented memories of the hospital, sterile white walls, concerned faces hovering over me, and the constant, throbbing pain where my left arm used to be. My name is Jonah Martin, and this happened to me in August of 2007. Been a ranger in Yosemite National Park since I could walk. It's my backyard, a place I know like the back of my hand, the smell of pine sap, the feel of granite beneath my boots, the familiar squawk of ravens circling half-dome. Or at least I thought I knew it. I was nearing retirement, looking forward to long, lazy mornings on my cabin porch instead of dawn patrols and scolding tourists. Then it started. The first report was from a scrappy trio of backpackers, flushed with sunburn and youthful audacity. They swore they'd seen something enormous moving near their campsite, disappearing into the dense forest at the edge of the valley. They told their story with wide eyes and hushed whispers, the classic signs of an overactive imagination fueled by too many nights under the stars. I smiled, gave them some safety tips, and chalked it up to inexperience. Then came more reports. A harried family swore something had circled their minivan at night, describing unnervingly human eyes gleaming out of the darkness. A seasoned hiker, a man known for his no-nonsense attitude, filed a report of a mangled deer carcass, its ribcage torn open in a disturbingly unnatural way. Something was stirring in the shadows of Yosemite, something that defied easy explanations. The higher-ups predictably downplayed it. Bear activity, poachers, the usual attempts to confine the wilderness within familiar categories. Those of us on the ground, though, we knew different. We kept a closer eye on the woods, our senses constantly on alert. There was a tension in the air, a sense that the old balance had shifted. I took fewer solo shifts, an unspoken but necessary precaution. It should have been a simple supply run, a routine trip into the neighboring town to replenish our stock of trail maps and bug spray. That's when I saw the Turner family, Emily, her husband Peter, and their six-year-old daughter, Maya. They were the picture-perfect embodiment of an outdoor vacation, matching backpacks, neatly pressed hiking clothes, and Maya clutching a worn stuffed rabbit. I stopped to chat, offering directions and a friendly warning about the heat. Maya hid behind her mother's legs, staring at me with wide eyes, unnervingly serious for a child her age. There are monsters in the woods, she said in a small, solemn voice. The words hung in the air, a jolt of dread in the sunny afternoon. Don't scare the ranger, honey. Emily chided, ruffling her daughter's hair with a nervous laugh. Peter looked uneasy, the forced cheer of their vacation faltering. I gave Maya a reassuring smile, but I couldn't shake the memory of her eyes, dark and filled with an unsettling certainty. Later that week, the Turner family vanished. Their campsite was found abandoned, their tents slashed and belongings scattered as if some large animal had ripped through it. A frantic search yielded nothing but a single, chilling find, Maya's stuffed rabbit, torn and muddied, lying at the edge of the tree lean. The official explanation was predictable. They must have wandered off trail, gotten lost, maybe even met with foul play from a fellow hiker. Unofficially, 
a cold fear spread through the rangers. We knew they hadn't simply gotten lost. Something was out there, something that targeted families and lured children into the darkness. Armed and accompanied by a tight-knit crew that included my old friend and fellow ranger, Elena, I ventured deeper into the forest than we ever had before. Elena was tough, with a wiry frame and a sharp wit that belied her kind heart. We'd been through a lot together, and I'd followed her lead, and vice versa, more times than I could count. The deeper we went, the more the forest seemed to change. The sunlight barely penetrated the thick canopy overhead, casting the woods in a perpetual gloom. The usual bird song was replaced by an oppressive silence. We pushed on, driven by a grim sense of duty and the chilling knowledge that with each step, we were venturing out of familiar territory and into the hunter's domain. Then we heard it. A low, guttural growl that echoed through the trees, sending a shiver down my spine. We froze, rifles raised, our senses straining to pierce the shadows. For a tense eternity, nothing happened. Whatever was out there was watching, waiting. Suddenly, Elena yelled, There! There was a blur of movement, a flash of ragged fur as something impossibly large lunged out of the undergrowth. Elena fired. I fired too, the gunshots shattering the tense silence. The thing let out a roar that resonated through the trees, a chilling mix of fury and pain. It staggered, then turned and bolted, crashing through the undergrowth with surprising speed. We gave chase, adrenaline coursing through our veins. But it moved like a phantom through the trees, always one step ahead, drawing us deeper into its territory. Just when we'd catch a glimpse, it would dissolve back into the shadows, leaving behind only an unsettling feeling that we were the ones being hunted. The sun was beginning to set, casting long, distorted shadows through the trees. We were losing the light. We had to turn back. Jonah, it's too dangerous, Elena said, her voice ragged. I knew she was right. But something was gnawing at me, the image of Maya's vacant-eyed stuffed rabbit lying in the mud. Just a little further, I pleaded. We have to see what we're up against. With a sigh that was either resignation or pity, she nodded. We pushed deeper into the twilight gloom of the forest, our footsteps unnaturally loud in the oppressive silence. The air felt heavy, charged with a waiting menace. Up ahead, the trees thinned, giving way to a rocky clearing bathed in the waning sunlight. And there it stood. The creature was a grotesque mockery of life, a towering giant of matted fur and impossibly long, twisted limbs. Its head was a nightmarish fusion of animal, and something else, its jaw bristling with needle-like teeth. Its eyes, those terrible, burning eyes fixed on us with a chilling, malevolent intelligence. For a heartbeat, we could only stare, our minds grappling with the impossible reality before us. Then it moved. With a speed that defied its bulk, it lunged. I barely raised my rifle before a massive, clawed hand knocked it aside. Elena yelled and fired. The creature stumbled letting out a roar that split the air, but it didn't falter. It swiped at her, a blow that would have eviscerated her if she hadn't rolled aside in the nick of time. I scrambled for my fallen rifle, my hands shaking. I knew, with a bone-deep certainty, that this wasn't a fight we could win. Run! I shouted at Elena, though some dark part of me knew it was useless. She did sprinting back towards the tree lean with the creature in pursuit. Its focus was fixed on her, a single-minded predator intent on its prey. I could have run too, but I didn't. Instead, I raised my rifle and fired again, and again, a futile attempt to distract it. Maybe it worked, maybe it was just the cruel whimsy of the creature, 
but it suddenly changed course, veering away from Elena and turning its attention towards me. A flicker of relief, quickly replaced by a surge of icy dread, washed over me. At least she had a chance. The creature charged with terrifying speed. I fired one last desperate shot, more out of instinct than any real hope of stopping it. It roared, a sound of pain or rage I couldn't tell. One of its claws grazed my side, tearing my uniform and drawing a line of hot, stinging pain. I stumbled, falling to my knees, and braced for the killing blow. It never came. A blur of movement, a flash of steel, and suddenly Elena was between me and the creature. I'd forgotten she always carried a survival knife, a relic from her days as a military medic. Now, she held it like a warrior, her small frame radiating a fierce determination in the face of the monstrous behemoth. Run, you old fool! She yelled at me, her voice cracking with strain. This time I obeyed. I scrambled to my feet and retreated towards the forest, the sounds of snarls and shouts fading behind me. I didn't look back. I couldn't. All I could think about was Elena, buying me precious seconds with her own life. I burst out of the tree lean, back into the familiar, less terrifying world of the Yosemite Trail. Reinforcements came quickly. The search team fanned out through the woods, their shouts and the clatter of gear shattering the primeval silence. I tried to guide them, to point them towards the clearing, but my voice kept breaking, and the words seemed to catch in my throat. They needed more than my broken directions. They needed proof of the monstrous thing that lurked in the forest. But Elena and the creature, they were gone. We searched into the night, long after hope had flickered out. In the grim dawn, we found nothing. No trace of Elena, no sign of the creature, just the faint echo of the blood-curdling roar fading into the depths of the wilderness. Officially, Elena was listed as missing, another unexplained disappearance in the vast expanse of Yosemite. The case, like that of the Turner family, eventually went cold. I retired shortly after. Couldn't stand to look at the woods the same way, the comforting familiarity replaced by a bone-deep wariness. The cabin, once my sanctuary, now felt too remote, too exposed. I sold it, moved to a small, nondescript apartment in the city, desperately seeking the anonymity of crowds and the illusion of safety in numbers. Most days, the memories fade. I convinced myself it was a freak occurrence, a rogue monster, perhaps the last of its kind, now dead or moved on. But then come the nights when the woods creep into my dreams. I wake gasping for air, the echo of Elena's defiant shout, and the creature's roar ringing in my ears. I see Maya's solemn face, her dark eyes filled with a wisdom no child should possess, and remember her chilling whisper. There are monsters in the woods. I still walk the city parks, pushing through the throngs of unknowing faces. I look normal, unremarkable, like any other retiree taking in the afternoon sun. But some days I catch a glimpse of darkness in the shadows between the trees, a flicker of impossible movement at the edge of my vision. And on those days I hurry my steps, seeking the crowds again, the noise, anything to drown out the terrible silence of the wild. They dismiss the stories, the disappearances, the whispered tales passed down among rangers of a creature that haunts the deepest parts of Yosemite. They rationalize, explain, and try to confine the monstrous within the boundaries of the known. Maybe they're right. Maybe it's just the ramblings of a traumatized old man clinging to the memory of the woman who sacrificed herself for him. But deep down, in those terrible moments of twilight clarity, I know the truth. The wilderness is older and vaster than we can ever comprehend. Within its ancient depths, there are things that defy understanding, 
creatures that have stalked the shadows since long before human memory. And I know, with chilling certainty, that they're still out there. My name is Ben Tanner, and this happened to me in September of 2014. I've spent most of my adult life working as a ranger in Yellowstone National Park. Love it here, the geysers, the wildlife, that big sky feel. I'm married, got a couple of young kids. Life's pretty good, all in all, even with the occasional idiotic tourist and the long winters. Things started off normal enough. It was a crisp autumn morning, the kind that makes you want to put on a flannel shirt and sip something hot around a campfire. I was on a routine patrol near the park's eastern boundary, the kind I've done a hundred times before. The usual tasks, checking trailheads, clearing litter, and reminding folks to keep their distance from bison. Around midday, I came across something out of the ordinary. A campsite, clearly abandoned in a hurry. Smashed up gear was scattered everywhere. A backpack torn open like some kind of animal had gone through it. No blood, that was the strange part. But there were footprints, monstrous things, even bigger than a grizzly's, and far too deep to be left by any human. My heart started pounding in a way that years of patrolling never had. I radioed for backup, more out of a sense of protocol than any real hope they'd get there in time. It was remote territory, and I was on my own with whatever had made those tracks. I followed the trail, my ranger instincts overriding my creeping unease. The footprints led deeper into the woods, away from the well-marked paths, towards a section of the park most tourists never see. The sun began its descent, casting long shadows, the cheerful birdsong replaced by an unsettling quiet. The air felt thick, charged with a waiting menace. And then I heard it, a growl so deep it resonated in my chest. My blood ran cold. Whatever made those tracks, it was close. I spotted movement up ahead, a hulking shape disappearing behind a cluster of trees. Too big to be a bear, its shoulders too broad, its stride too uneven. A sense of unreality washed over me, an icy denial in the face of the impossible. My feet were moving before my brain fully registered what I was seeing. It was stalking me, playing with its prey. I ran. Branches whipped at my face, Roots snagged at my feet, but I pushed on, propelled by a primal terror. I could hear the creature behind me, its snarls and the crashing of its immense body through the undergrowth. I didn't dare look back. All I could do was focus on reaching the clearing up ahead, a sliver of hope cutting through the all-consuming fear. I burst out of the tree lean, my lungs burning, my vision blurring. But the clearing wasn't the sanctuary I'd envisioned. In its center stood a half-eaten deer carcass, the bones picked nearly clean and the ground littered with impossibly large, clawed footprints. Panic clawed at my throat. I was out of options. The backup I'd called for, they were miles away, too far to save me. My rifle felt comically inadequate against the enormity of the thing lurking just beyond the trees. It was a hunter now, patiently circling its cornered meal. I was on the menu. With shaking hands I fumbled for my service pistol, more a gesture of defiance than any real defense. I raised it, trying to steady my ragged breaths, knowing this was the end. There was a flicker of movement at the edge of the tree lean, a flash of ragged fur, and then it was upon me. It was larger than anything imaginable, a grotesque fusion of bear, wolf, and something unnatural. Its eyes glowed with a predatory intelligence, and its twisted, elongated limbs seemed designed for tearing and killing. A guttural roar ripped from its throat, and it charged. 
I fired, emptying my pistol in a desperate, futile barrage. The bullet struck, drawing pained growls, but it didn't slow its advance. It swatted aside my gun like a toy, a sickening crunch echoing through the clearing. And then time seemed to stretch into an eternity. I could see the individual bristles of its matted coat, the impossibly long claws reaching for me, the stench of its fetid breath. My life flashed before my eyes, not some grand highlight reel, but the ordinary moments. My kids laughing, the smell of my wife's hair, hot coffee on a cold morning, the life I was about to lose. I closed my eyes, bracing for the end. The creature's roar intensified, its hot breath washing over me. I waited for the crushing blow, the tearing of flesh. A gunshot cracked through the air, followed by another. The creature shrieked, a bone-chilling sound of rage and pain. I dared to open my eyes. There, at the edge of the clearing, stood a small group of figures fellow rangers, their rifles leveled at the writhing mass of fur and fury. A flicker of hope ignited in my chest. My backup had arrived. The barrage of gunfire continued, forcing the creature to stumble back. It glared at the rangers with a chilling malevolence, then turned, crashing back into the woods with unexpected speed. I scrambled to my feet, my legs rubbery beneath me. My fellow rangers rushed towards me, their faces a mixture of shock and concern. Ben, you okay? It was Miller, a seasoned ranger with a voice like gravel, his usually stoic expression replaced with a genuine alarm. I could only manage a shaky nod, my gaze fixated on the tree lean where the creature had vanished. Questions flew at me, a jumbled chorus of worry and disbelief. I answered on autopilot, my mind still grappling with the monstrous reality of the past few minutes. We secured the scene, the gruesome deer carcass a chilling centerpiece to an otherwise pristine wilderness. As word of the attack spread, fear descended over the camp. The usual ranger duties suddenly felt insignificant in the face of the unknown horror lurking in the park's depths. We patrolled in heavily armed groups, eyes constantly darting towards the shadows, the vast beauty of Yellowstone tainted by a lurking dread. The creature remained elusive. Days stretched into weeks of heightened tension. We found more monstrous footprints, heard blood-curdling roars echoing through the night, and discovered the occasional ravaged wildlife carcass, stripped bare with unnatural efficiency. The official statements downplayed it. Animal attack, exaggeration, the usual attempts to confine the unthinkable within the boundaries of the familiar. It was easier that way, safer for park tourism. But those of us on the front lines we knew. I took no more solo patrols. The constant watchfulness, the phantom rustle of every leaf, chipped away at my sanity. Sleep became a fragmented battleground of claws and glowing eyes. My wife insisted I take time off, but the thought of leaving my fellow rangers felt like a betrayal, a cowardly escape from a shared nightmare. Then came the Thompsons. A family from Texas. Two parents, teenage daughter and young son, their vacation enthusiasm like a splash of unwelcome color in the grim pallor that had settled over our ranger station. We warned them repeatedly, the cautionary tales and restricted areas no longer mere formalities, but desperate pleas born of experience. Still, they ventured out, drawn by the same wild beauty that held us captive. They never returned. We found their abandoned SUV a few miles into the park, the cheerful bumper stickers mocking the grim reality. A search party scoured the woods, dreading what we knew they would find. They returned two days later, faces ashen, carrying a single, tattered backpack with a child-sized sleeping bag crudely ripped from it. There was so little left. Just enough for identification. 
No sign of the creature, of course. It was too clever, too brutal to leave such obvious evidence of its monstrous existence. That was my breaking point. The Thompsons, their innocent obliviousness echoing the naivety I'd clung to just weeks ago, shattered the last of my denial. I submitted my resignation the next day. Couldn't face going back out there. Couldn't live with the guilt that every rustle of leaves might be another family venturing into the hunter's domain. My wife, bless her, didn't fight the decision. We packed up that old, reliable SUV, and with one last, haunted look at the looming mountains, we left Yellowstone behind. We moved across the country, seeking the anonymity of a crowded East Coast city. I tried to find solace in the relentless bustle, the concrete towers blotting out the memory of the towering redwoods. Found a desk job, wore a suit, did my best to be a good husband and father. Pretended to be a normal man untouched by the monstrous shadows that lurked at the edges of my nightmares. It sort of worked for a while. We carved out a routine, a fragile illusion of normalcy built on unspoken fears and shared trauma. Then reports started filtering in from the news. Gruesome animal deaths in Yellowstone, a few missing hikers, disappearances dismissed as unfortunate accidents in the vast wilderness. Each headline ignited a flare of icy dread in my gut, a sickening confirmation that the nightmare wasn't over. My wife, Sarah, noticed the change in me, the haunted looks, the jumpiness at any sudden noise, the way I'd sometimes stare at the shadows that stretched across our living room floor with the grim intensity of a hunter tracking his prey. She never said a word, just held me tighter on the nights I woke screaming, her silent support both heartbreaking and impossibly precious. One afternoon, my young son came running in from the street, flushed with excitement, clutching a crumpled newspaper. Daddy, look! he shouted, his small fingers pointing at a grainy photo, a blurry, hulking figure disappearing into the trees on the outskirts of Yellowstone. My name wasn't mentioned, but I felt the weight of those unseen eyes settle on me once more. I can't stay here. It's too dangerous for my family. The creature, it knows. Maybe it was instinct, or some twisted curiosity, but it knows I somehow escaped its territory. And now, it's widening its hunting grounds. Every day I stay, I put Sarah and the kids at risk. It's a twisted logic, I know, but the creature, the wilderness, they seep into your bones. It changes how you see the world, paranoia masked as survival instinct. I don't know where we'll go. Somewhere even more crowded, somewhere the shadows feel less alive. We'll vanish into the faceless masses, change our names, scrub away any trace of our past lives. Maybe it'll be enough. Or maybe nowhere is safe from a hunter so relentless. All I know for certain is that we can't stay, can't continue this fragile charade of normalcy. Some nights, I dream of Yellowstone. Not the creature, not the blood and the terror, but the park as it once was, the crisp air, the scent of pine, the wide, untroubled sky. In those dreams, I'm still a ranger, believing in the order of things, trusting in the boundaries between the human world and the wild. I miss that man, that naive certainty. But he died in that clearing with the half-eaten deer. Now I'm something else, a haunted survivor fleeing a shadow that stretches across a continent. My name is Ethan Walker, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I've been with the National Park Service nearly 10 years now, currently working in the vast expanse of Big Bend National Park down in Texas. Love the Desert feels different from other places I've worked, a stark, brutal kind of beauty. Took some adjusting, 
after the mountains of Wyoming and the pine forests of Maine. But it's grown on me. I was on backcountry patrol that week, one of those stints where it's mainly about reminding lost hikers about hydration protocols and checking that overnight campers are following regulations. Usually uneventful stuff, but necessary. This time of year, the heat gets fierce, and you want to head off trouble before it starts. Around midday on the third day, I got a radio transmission, a possible missing person report from a worried family member. The description sent chills down my spine. A middle-aged couple, experienced hikers, out on the South Rim Trail for two days and hadn't checked in as scheduled. It was a tough trail, gaining over 2,000 feet in elevation. Plenty of spots where an unlucky slip or a heat-induced stumble could cause problems. I knew the South Rim well, tackled it a bunch of times myself for the views and the sense of accomplishment. Drove out to the trailhead, gathered what details I could from the distraught daughter, and started my solo search. I was familiar with the protocol. Look for signs of deviation from the trail, gear, anything out of the ordinary, and radio for backup once the situation was assessed. The first few miles yielded nothing. Well-maintained trail, a few other hikers who reported nothing amiss, the usual sprawl of cacti and scrub brush under that merciless desert sun. Then I rounded a bend and saw it, a backpack, ripped open and abandoned near a rocky outcropping. A surge of dread washed over me as I recognized the brand, the same one described by the couple's daughter. I radioed for backup, the words tight in my throat. It was more than a lost hiker situation now. Something bad had happened out here. I approached the outcropping cautiously, rifle drawn, the silence broken only by the rasp of my own breath and there they were. Or rather, what was left of them. It was. It was a slaughterhouse. Blood-splattered rocks, shattered bones, shreds of clothing snagged on thorns. I stumbled back, wave of nausea threatening to overwhelm me. It wasn't an animal attack, nothing remotely normal. The injuries were grotesque, violent beyond anything I'd ever witnessed, even after all my years as a ranger. It was as though some impossibly powerful creature had torn them apart with brutal, frenzied rage. Backup arrived an agonizing hour later, a forensics team, a grim-faced crew of fellow rangers, and the inevitable park higher-ups trying to contain the damage the gruesome discovery would cause. They questioned me, scrutinized my account, the unspoken suspicion hovering in the overheated air. Ranger loses it in the desert, creates a gruesome scene for some twisted reason. I didn't blame them. The crime scene defied belief. I knew how insane it sounded. But I also knew what I saw. Nights that followed were a nightmare blur. Snatches of images, gleaming yellow eyes in the desert darkness, the guttural roar that echoed in the barren canyons, the way the searchlights swept over the rocks, highlighting the blood but never finding whatever made those monstrous wounds. I started sleeping with a loaded gun under my pillow, jumping at every creaking floorboard, every flicker of headlights outside my window. Finally, word came down. The official cause of death, Animal attack, perpetrator unknown, case closed. Just like that. The evidence, they said, was inconclusive, the injuries not inconsistent with some unknown predator defending its territory. They buried the couple in the dusty cemetery on the outskirts of the park, another grim statistic of wilderness that can never be fully tamed. But I saw the hesitation in the eyes of the forensic specialists, heard the whispers shared around campfires when they thought I was out of earshot. The other rangers, the ones I'd worked side by side with for years, started giving me wide berth. I was the one touched by the unexplainable, tainted by an experience they couldn't even begin to fathom. My protests felt hollow, 
my insistence on something out there, something monstrous, landing not with the urgency of truth, but with the echoes of a mind starting to unravel in the wake of trauma. I'm writing this from a motel room in some nameless town on the edge of the desert, a few hastily packed belongings stuffed into my weathered old duffel bag. I handed in my resignation this morning. Can't stay here, not with that constant, gnawing dread coiling in my gut like a venomous snake. Can't stay and risk it coming for me next. They can dismiss the horror, write their reports, explain it all away with neat bureaucratic phrases. But out there, in the vast expanse where the sun casts stark shadows and the wind whispers through the canyons, something lurks. Something unnatural. And after what I saw, I think it knows where to find me. I don't know where I'll go, or how long I can keep running. Maybe I'll head north, lose myself in the anonymous sprawl of a big city, where the worst predators walk on two legs. Maybe I'm being paranoid, maybe I did somehow manufacture those horrors in a mind pushed past its breaking point by the relentless desert and the brutal solitude doesn't matter. Every rustle of leaves, every flicker of shadow sets off a jolt of adrenaline in my veins, makes me picture those impossibly large clawed feet, that gaping, monstrous maw dripping with. I think I heard a noise outside my room. I'll go check. The floorboards creaked beneath my boots, every sound amplified in the echoing silence of the cheap motel room. I moved towards the window, my grip tightening on the gun. Something was there, a flicker of movement just beyond the faded yellow curtain. My gut clenched, a scream caught in my throat. It couldn't be, couldn't have tracked me down. I closed my eyes for a split second, a futile attempt at gathering my shattered composure. No point in hiding, no use in cowering. I tore open the curtain braced for anything. Empty. The dusty parking lot, silent and still under the harsh fluorescent lights, stretched out before me. A battered pickup truck hummed in the distance, a lone figure hunched over the wheel. Ordinary. My pulse hammered in my ears as relief crashed over me, followed swiftly by a wave of shame. I was losing it. Seeing threats in every shadow, my nerves frayed beyond repair. But then, a movement caught my eye. On the edge of the parking lot, where a stand of mesquite trees cast long, skeletal shadows, a figure was watching. Too tall, too thin, standing unnaturally still in the harsh light. And as it turned its head towards me, moonlight gleamed on two impossibly bright yellow eyes. My breath caught. It was him, no, it, the creature. It was here. In this nondescript nowhere town, it had found me. This was the end. A bitter resignation washed over me, replacing the frantic terror. I couldn't run any more. I raised my gun, more in defiance than in any real belief that it would have an effect. The creature observed me. No sign of fear in its inhuman glare, only a cold, calculating intelligence. It took a step forward, a sinuous, unhurried movement that belied its grotesque shape. With each step, the details became chillingly clear, the ragged, mottled fur draped over its hulking frame, the impossibly long limbs tipped with sickle claws designed for tearing. Its head was like a nightmarish fusion of wolf and something else, all teeth and predatory instinct. A low growl rumbled from its throat. I fired a warning shot, more of a plea than a threat. The report shattered the night, the creature flinched, but didn't retreat. It was toying with me, its hunter's instinct playing out this cruel game to the bitter end. I fired again and again. At first, it seemed as though the bullets had no effect, simply angering it further. But then, it let out a shriek, a sound of rage and pain that echoed off the crumbling walls of the motel. 
A thin trickle of blood, eerily black in the moonlight, seeped from a wound on its massive shoulder. A flicker of something like hope ignited in me. It wasn't invincible. It could be hurt, maybe even. My desperate thoughts were cut off as the creature charged, a blur of claws and fangs. I managed to get another shot off before it slammed into me, sending both of us crashing against the flimsy wall. Its stench enveloped me, rotting meat, something feral. I kicked out wildly, trying to dislodge it. The force of its impact had knocked the breath out of me, stars bursting in my vision. With a strength born of desperation, I fumbled for the discarded gun, my fingers slipping in the creature's hot, foul blood. The motel room door burst open, and the startled face of an elderly night clerk peered in. He screamed, a shrill sound that pierced the chaos, then turned and ran, his flimsy slippers slapping against the cracked concrete. The distraction was all I needed. The creature, momentarily startled by the noise, twisted its monstrous head. I seized the gun, jamming the barrel against its matted fur, and fired. And fired again. The reports echoed in the confined space, deafening me as the creature roared in agony. It thrashed, clawing at its face, its movements becoming less focused, frantic. I scrambled away, dragging myself across the debris-strewn parking lot, the creature's pained snarls fading behind me. I didn't know how badly I'd injured it, whether it would pursue me, but blind instinct propelled me forward. Stumbling into the battered pickup, I fumbled for the keys, my hands shaking. I barely got it started before the motel room door exploded outward, the creature's immense form silhouetted against the now-empty doorway. It staggered then, with one final, chilling glare in my direction, it turned and vanished into the shadows beneath the mesquite trees. I drove. I drove through the night, fueled by adrenaline and lingering terror. The headlights cut a swathe across endless highway, the monotony both terrifying and comforting. Every creak of the old truck, every flicker of movement in the rearview mirror sent my heart pounding anew. My side ached, and my head throbbed, but I couldn't stop, not until I was far, far away from the desolate stretch of desert and the motel parking lot marked with blood. By dawn, I'd cross state lines and abandoned the truck in a nondescript suburb. A bus heading north seemed as good a destination as any. I sank into the worn seat, trying in vain to ignore the stares directed at my disheveled appearance, the dark circles under my eyes, and the gun I still clutched with numb fingers. The landscape word passed in a blur as I tried to process what had happened. A part of me, a fading fragment of rationality, clung to the hope that it had all been a psychotic break, a final descent into PTSD-fueled madness. The news report a week later shattered that illusion. A headline screamed from a tattered newspaper left on a neighboring bus seat. Gruesome animal attack leaves hikers dead in Big Bend. The photo, grainy and horrific, showed a campsite ravaged in a sickening echo of the scene that started my nightmare. My trembling hands dropped the paper. They'd covered it up again, contained the impossible within the safety of the explainable. I bought a ticket back to the desert town, back to the motel room littered with evidence of the impossible struggle. The room was untouched, a shrine to a horror nobody else believed. I packed my meager belongings, an unsettling determination forming within me. It's out there, and others will die because of the lies and the cover-ups. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm the only one who sees it for what it truly is. But I won't let them dismiss what happened, won't let them bury the truth along with the broken bodies it leaves in its wake. I can't stay. Each rustle of wine through the mesquite, each creak of the aging floorboards, is a whisper of its presence. But I won't disappear quietly into the faceless oblivion of the city either. 
I know where to go, know the vast, shadowy places where it hunts. I won't live in fear. I'll become the hunter. My name is Maya Walker, and this happened to me in August of 2019. Love being a ranger in Sequoia National Park. Those giant trees, something about them makes you feel small and a part of something ancient all at once. I'm usually with a crew, but today I'm on solo patrol, nothing out of the ordinary, just checking on campsites, trail conditions, the usual. Late afternoon, I'm about three miles into the Redwood Canyon Trail. It's getting towards that magic hour when the sunlight filters through the canopy and sets the whole forest aglow. I should be turning around soon, but something catches my attention. Off the trail, tucked behind some ferns, is a backpack. Looks new, fancy brand. Probably a day hiker who wandered off, maybe got turned around. Happens all the time. I radio it in and start looking for other stuff left behind. Gear strewn about would be a sign of trouble. I find nothing else for a good ten-yard radius. Weird, but no big deal. I'm about to give up when a flash of color catches my eye. It's a stuffed toy, a plush rabbit with one ear missing. I kneel down, pick it up. It's damp, like it's been out here a while but otherwise seems fine. I give it a little squeeze, the kind of mindless thing you do when holding a kid's toy. A shiver runs down my spine. Something feels off. It hits me then. This isn't just some lost toy. There's a sick familiarity about it, like something dredged up from a half-remembered nightmare. The missing ear, the dampness, like it's been clutched in a sweaty, terrified little fist. I shake my head, try to clear the sudden, unwelcome wave of dread. It's ridiculous. Suddenly, I hear a snap behind me. I whirl around, heart pounding. Across a small clearing, maybe twenty feet away, it's watching me. The first impression is one of size. It's huge, towering over my six-foot frame. Long, unnaturally spindly limbs tipped with claws-like steak knives and thick, dark, ragged fur covering its body. The head is the worst part, a twisted canine snout, all teeth and predatory eyes glowing a dull yellow in the waning light. A strangled noise escapes my throat and it lunges, silent and incredibly fast for something its size. I barely dodge the first swipe stumbling back and fumbling for my sidearm. The thing moves at blurring speed, a whirlwind of claws and gnashing teeth. I fire, more out of a panicked instinct than any real aim. The bullet strikes the creature, and it roars, a bone-chilling shriek of pain and fury that echoes through the trees. I'm scrambling back, trying to find something to put between me and the monstrous thing. I fire again and again, the reports of the gun deafening in the quiet of the forest. The shots seem to be having an effect, slowing it down, causing it to flinch. It snarls, a guttural sound that vibrates through my whole body, revealing rows of teeth like jagged shards of glass, flecked with blood. My blood? I can't tell. There's an acrid, foul smell in the air something metallic and rotten. My shots have hit it, wounded it, but they haven't stopped it. It's insane. Nothing I've ever trained for prepares you for something like this. I'm nearly out of ammo. My breasts come in ragged gasps. Every muscle in my body screams with exertion, and every instinct is screaming to run. But there's nowhere to run. No safety. Only the trees casting long shadows, the undergrowth hiding endless threats, and those glowing eyes tracking my every move. And then it does the unexpected. It hesitates. The guttural noises fade, its ragged breaths slow. 
those glowing eyes fix on me, then flick towards the direction I came from, the direction of the trailhead, and civilization. Slowly it backs up a step, then another. It doesn't turn, keeping its eyes locked on me as it retreats into the shadows. A sliver of hope ignites in me. Is it retreating? Is it over? For a frozen moment, nothing happens. Just me, the creature in the shadows, and the oppressive silence of the redwood forest. Then, with a final, low growl that seems to shake the ancient trees themselves, it turns and vanishes into the deepening gloom. I don't know how long I stand there, my body still locked in fight or flight. My gun hand is numb. Distantly, I hear voices and the crunch of footsteps approaching. Backup has arrived, called in by my garbled, incoherent report once I got through the shock enough to radio. They find the rabbit, the blood-splattered clearing marked with monstrous tracks, the shredded trees bearing the marks of impossibly powerful claws. And they find me, shaking like a leaf, mumbling over and over some garbled nonsense about yellow eyes and a missing ear. They put it down to bear attack, mauling by a rogue coyote, anything to fit the unimaginable into familiar boxes. The official statements speak of heightened vigilance, trail closures. I hear the whispers, the sidelong glances from my fellow rangers, the well-meaning but awkward offers of counseling. It wasn't a bear, not a coyote. I know what I saw, but I also know what happens when the impossible becomes real. The months that follow are a blur. Mandatory leave turns into a fog of sleepless nights of waking in a cold sweat at the phantom sound of claws scraping against my windowpane. I see those glowing eyes in every shadow, smell that rotting meat stench every time the wind rustles the leaves. I jump at every creak of the floorboards in my tiny cabin. I try to convince myself it's over, that the creature moved on. But deep down, I know it's out there. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine I can hear it pad silently through the trees near my cabin, its low growl echoing in the forest silence. And always, at the edge of my awareness, there's the lingering question, the horrifying possibility, did it retreat that day because it found a better hunting ground? The turning point comes six months after the attack. A routine newspaper skin, morbid curiosity masquerading as normalcy hits me with the force of a physical blow. Small headline, buried in the local section, Missing Child, Sequoia National Park. The picture shows a smiling girl, about nine years old, with a wanted stuffed rabbit clutched in her hand. The rabbit looks sickeningly familiar. That's when I make my decision. It's a gamble, a desperate one, but I can't stay, can't pretend anymore. I have to find it. If it's hunting humans now, if it's taking children. I can't live with the guilt that I could have done something and did nothing. The thought of another family torn apart, another life lost to those glowing eyes, is a chilling absolution. It releases a kind of twisted energy within me. I spend weeks preparing, my ranger training kicking in but with a dark new focus. The gear I pack is a strange mix of the official and the unofficial, trail maps, high-powered rifle, night vision goggles, and a hunting knife forged by a local survivalist who looked at me with a strange mix of skepticism and something like understanding. Before I leave, I write it all down. Not some rambling, incoherent rant, but a meticulously detailed account of that day, descriptions of the creature, its behavior patterns, potential weak spots. I seal the envelope and leave it addressed to my old partner, Jonas, the one ranger who seems to have a flicker of doubt in his eyes when I speak of the attack. If I don't come back, he'll know what to do, if he has the courage. The Redwood Canyon Trail is ominously quiet when I step foot on it. The air feels heavy, expectant. 
I walk for hours, senses on high alert. The silence is the worst, broken only by the pounding of my own heart, and an increasingly oppressive feeling of being watched. I find tracks, prints so large they would dwarf even a grizzly's paw. The sight of the shredded bark where I battled the creature sends a jolt of terror through me, but I force myself forward. Hours turn into what feels like days. The familiar trail becomes a maze of looming redwoods and treacherous ravines. Exhaustion gnaws at me like a feral thing, but I push on. I've become the prey now, driven by a desperate, fragile hope that I can become the hunter once again. I sleep on the forest floor, fitful snatches between periods of hypervigilant wakefulness. Every rustle, every snap of a twig sends adrenaline jolting through my veins. On the third night I see it again. A flash of movement in my peripheral vision, the flicker of those terrible eyes in the darkness. Fear battles with a grim determination. I won't cower. I'll force the confrontation, end this nightmare, one way or another. With a silent prayer I track it. The hunt is on. We move in a deadly game of hide and seek through the ancient forest. The creature is cunning. It circles back, tests my defenses, toys with me. But the little girl's face, the memory of that ragged rabbit, fuels my every move. Finally, it happens. I round a bend and nearly collide with it. No escape this time. The moon casts an eerie glow, enough for me to aim the rifle with trembling hands. I fire and fire again. The creature roars, the sound primal and deafening. It's wounded, but it charges, impossibly fast. I drop the rifle and lunge for the hunting knife. I'm no match for its strength. It knocks me aside, sending me sprawling against the unforgiving ground. I see the gleam of ivory teeth, taste the foulness of its breath, and brace for the crushing blow that will end it all. The blow doesn't come. Suddenly, a blur of movement explodes out of the darkness. Gunfire echoes through the night. The creature lets out a shriek, a different sound this time laced with shock and confused pain. It stumbles, turns, and flees into the undergrowth with surprising speed. Scrambling to my feet, I see another figure standing in the dappled moonlight. It's Jonas, face set in grim determination, rifle still raised. A sob catches in my throat. It's over. It's really over. The aftermath is a mess of law enforcement— park closures, and half-baked cover stories. The mutilated corpses they find scattered throughout the forest don't fit any conventional narrative, but the official statements speak of everything but the truth. Jonas and I, we tell them what we can, knowing we will never be fully believed. We share a burden now, a dark secret that binds us and sets us apart from our fellow rangers. Sequoia still holds the same ancient magic, but it's forever tainted by the lurking darkness I unveiled. We go back to our jobs, back to patrolling the trails. We keep silent watch. They may dismiss the monstrous, but we know. We saw the truth in the glowing yellow eyes, the bloody fur, and the ragged, one-eared rabbit clutched in a skeletal hand found deep in the redwood wilds. Sometimes, in the heavy silence before dawn, I feel a chill crawl down my spine. An echo of those inhuman eyes on my skin, an imagined whisper from the impenetrable darkness. But then Jonas will appear, stepping out of the mist like a silent sentinel, sharing a burdened glance. And in that silent exchange, there's a flicker of defiant hope. We are the guardians now, the keepers of the monstrous secret, the last line of defense against the shadows that haunt the Redwood Canyon. My name is Elliot Reed, 
and this happened to me on October 12, 2008. I've been a park ranger here at Glacier National Park for almost five years, longer than I typically hang around anywhere. The mountains, something about the quiet power of them, it gets in your blood. Most days are routine, trail maintenance, chatting with tourists to remind them not to feed the bears, the occasional lost hiker. I live for those moments of quiet, feeling just another small part of this vast, ancient place. Today was different. Got a report of an abandoned campsite near Lake Josephine. Hikers further up the trail found it a little too spooky, ransacked tent, food scattered, no signs of the campers. I've dealt with plenty of bear break-ins, but this felt wrong. I hiked for about two hours, the trail twisting through the dense forest. It was oddly silent, not even the usual bird song. Every rustle sent an uneasy jolt down my spine. I found the camp. The scene was even worse than I'd imagined. The tent was shredded, not just clawed open. Sleeping bags and clothes were strewn around, like something had been violently searching or playing. There was a sickening, sweet smell clinging to the whole mess. My hand dropped to my holstered pistol. Black bear, maybe? Or something got to a carcass nearby, the kind of frenzied eating that could have made a mess like this. I had to follow protocol, secure the area, look for any sign of the hikers, report back. I started at the tent, moving outward in a slow spiral. Found some blood splatter low on a tree trunk. Then a scrap of blue fabric snagged on a branch. Whatever happened here wasn't pretty. I came to a large clearing, and then everything went cold. There was a pile of something. My stomach clenched. Mostly clothes shredded further, stained with blood and God. Was that bone I was seeing? My skin crawled. This wasn't an animal attack. Something far worse had happened here. It took every bit of ranger training to force myself closer. That's when I saw the hand. Or most of it. The fingers were wrong. Too long, too thin, ending in black claws like chipped obsidian. The world suddenly lurched into hyperfocus. Every cracking twig was a threat. My heart pounded so loud I imagined it would echo through the trees. There, at the edge of the clearing, something moved. Too tall, too lanky to be human, dissolving into the shadows of the trees as quickly as I caught sight of it. Then it came for me. Not at a run, but in a flicker of motion, impossible bursts of speed. I only registered darkness lunging before it was already on top of me those terrible claws raking at my chest. I managed to fire my pistol, more in a panic than aimed. I didn't know if I even hit anything, the noise deafening. It hissed, a long, scratchy sound that could freeze your marrow, then retreated. I was on the ground, scrambling back, gun forgotten. My chest was on fire, but then, miraculously, it wasn't bleeding. Instead, the flesh bubbled, already starting to blister, like some horrible chemical burn. And under the pain, I could feel something crawling, worming its way into my skin I saw the creature again, just a silhouette. Tall, spindly, with a head that seemed to melt into its too long neck. Eyes, the only way I can describe them is pits of cold, hungry emptiness. It watched me head tilted at an unnatural angle. Then it did something that still haunts my nightmares. That terrible face creased, not in a smile, but a chilling mockery of one. Terror was my fuel now. Somehow, I was on my feet, running. I didn't know where, didn't care. It stayed on my heels, sometimes just out of sight, sometimes darting across my path, almost toying with me. I stumbled out onto a familiar trail, sheer luck. But luck couldn't outrun whatever hunted me. 
I heard it gaining, breath rasping, then a blur of darkness launched from the tree lean. But it wasn't aiming for me. I saw a flash of blonde hair, then a hiker, mid-stride, was suddenly yanked off the trail with impossible force. Her scream echoed mine, then was cut horribly short. The woods fell silent. I staggered back, then did the one thing my training screamed against I ran into the trees. Zigzagging, crashing through undergrowth, praying sheer desperation would keep me one step ahead of that monster. Night was falling fast. Each rustle was its footfall, each hoot of an owl its call. I found an old hollow tree trunk, just big enough to squeeze inside. I curled up, shaking in the pitch dark, those inhuman eyes burned into my mind. Hours stretched into eternity. My whole body pulsed with pain, my shirt stuck to my blistering skin. The creature seemed to be waiting, circling just beyond sight. I clung to the faint hope that with daylight, it would disappear. Whatever this thing was, it hated the sun. That's the only reason I survived the first attack. Come dawn, the woods were still eerily quiet. Not a single bird dared sing. I crept out, every muscle screaming in protest. Every shadow made me flinch. I found the trail again, and I stumbled back towards base camp. I didn't know how I would explain what happened. What proof was there, other than my own half-mad story and these burns? They were already darkening, black veins creeping out from the epicenter. The hike back was an excruciating blur. By the time I reached the familiar clearing near the park entrance, I thought I was hallucinating. Yellow tape, police cars, a news van with their satellite dishes pointed skyward. Someone had found the campsite and the bodies. Or what was left of them. Chaos engulfed me. Medics tried to tend to my injuries but drew back when they saw the burns. Questions bombarded me from police, rangers, reporters a relentless swarm with no answers I could give. The blonde hiker I'd seen snatched. They found what was left of her. Another missing person's case in the ever-growing file of disappearances plaguing Glacier. They wanted to know what I saw. Words failed me. How do you describe a nightmare come to life? A creature so alien, so wrong, that it defied explanation. Every time I tried, it was branded into my memory again. Those claws, those eyes, that unholy smile. They thought I was in shock. They weren't wrong, but not just from the attack. It was something else now, a terrifying certainty. This wasn't over. Whatever was out there, it had a taste for me now. My burns wouldn't heal. I was shuttled from hospital to specialists, poked, prodded, the whispers of bioweapon swirling around me. They kept me isolated, quarantined. The looks in their eyes... They thought I was some kind of monster, too. That whatever poisoned my veins wasn't something natural. I broke out one night. Stole a car, headed north. There's a cabin, an old family thing tucked deep in the Canadian Rockies. Remote as I could think of. Maybe if I hid far enough, if it couldn't find me. My hope was naive. The changes started weeks after the attack. Nightmares worse than the memory, vivid and visceral like I was reliving the hunt. My sleep was shredded, waking up drenched in sweat and ice-cold terror. My reflection became a stranger. My skin took on a pallid, sickly sheen, and the veins from my burns were spreading, snaking under my skin like living things. Hunger gnawed at me, not for food, but something primal and growing stronger by the day. I started finding animal carcasses near the cabin, half-eaten, not by anything I could identify. Then came the night when I couldn't deny it any longer. I woke up in the woods, 
moonlight glinting off slick red fur that didn't belong on my hands. The trees blurred as I ran on four legs, a power, a predatory grace, surging in me that both terrified and thrilled. My howls echoed into the night, not human, but carrying a mournful edge that was all too much my own. I'm not sure what came first, the creature in the woods or the one slowly consuming me from within. The infection, the transformation, whatever you call it, I was becoming something just as terrible, a twisted reflection of the monster that marked me. The aftermath is tragic on too many counts to measure. The lives lost in the park, the families torn apart. I know they're still out there hunting for the thing. They'll never stop. Probably best that way. But as for me, I'm a ghost living on borrowed time. There's a part of me, dwindling with each passing moon, that still hopes some hero with a silver bullet can end this. Deep down, I know that's not how my story ends. Out here in the vast solitude, there's part of me that welcomes it. Every night the changed part of me grows stronger, the hunger more insatiable. One day soon, I won't be writing my story anymore. I'll be out there with the other predator, running under the indifferent stars, and whatever shred of Elliot Reed that remains will be no more than a fading scream lost in the wind. My name is Carter Hayes, and this happened to me on July 25th, 2010. I've been with the National Park Service for a decade, Olympic National Park for the past four. It's rugged, it's wild. I came up here from California for the solitude, the ancient rainforest, the raw power of the ocean. I craved that quiet after growing up in L.A., Today started like any other. Gear check, briefing with the rest of the crew. There was just me and Rob, my partner, on trail maintenance out near the Ho River. We bicker like an old married couple, keeps things interesting. It's hard work, but the deep green of the old growth forest, it gets in your blood. It was early afternoon when we hit a bad patch. Slide must have come down in the night washed away a section of trail. We radioed it in, split up to look for a safe detour. Rob went up trail. I started marking the damaged section with hazard tape. That was when the prickle at the back of my neck started. Not just nerves this forest has cougars and the occasional bear. No, this felt older and wrong. There was no sound but a bone-deep certainty that I was being watched. Funny time for jokes, Rob. I called out, trying to shake the feeling. No answer. Probably messing with me. He knows I hate being alone out here. Then I caught a glimpse of movement too fast to be an animal. There, behind a moss-covered boulder, a flash of something pale, inhumanly tall. My breath hitched in my throat. A trick of the light, surely. I drew my pistol, the weight of it a sliver of comfort. Rob, you in the area? Cut it out, man. Silence. My gut clenched, an instinct screaming at me I couldn't name. I crept towards the boulder, gun raised. Nothing. The forest seemed to hold its breath around me. And then the smell hit me. Like rot but with an acrid tang underneath. It turned my stomach. I started to back away when a low sound echoed behind me. A snarl with a strange, rasping edge. I whirled, and everything tilted into a waking nightmare. It stood just beyond the tree lean. Too tall, limbs stretched and bent at wrong angles. Skin tight and waxy, gray-white like a fish belly. Its head, I still struggle for words. Stretched and narrow, with a mouth full of needle teeth, too wide, too full. And the eyes, bottomless black pits that seemed to burn into me. It cocked its head, 
a bird considering a worm. Before I could even process, it blurred towards me. I fired, more from blind terror than aim. The shot echoed, birds scattering. The creature stumbled, hissed, and a thick, black liquid gushed from its shoulder. That sickly smell intensified, burning my nostrils. But it wasn't slowing. I turned and ran. Every instinct told me I was prey now. Stumbling, crashing through the undergrowth, heart jackhammering against my ribs. Its footfalls pounded behind me, sometimes a rustle through the branches to my side. I was being toyed with, a mouse before the kill. Up ahead, a flicker of sunlight through the trees. The river. I could cross, maybe lose this thing. Hope surged, replacing terror just enough to fuel my legs. Then Rob's voice crackled over the radio. Carter? Respond! I've marked a detour route, heading back to meet A.C.K. The radio went dead, cut off by a chilling screech. I burst out onto the river bank. Rob lay sprawled on the rocks, his legs at an impossible angle. Something dark and slick dripped from his chest, staining the stones. His eyes were wide, staring up at me in silent horror. The creature was behind him, crouched over Rob's body. It lifted its head, and what might have been a grin warped across its hideous face. In that moment, I realized the truth. This wasn't a predator hunting for a meal. This was something far worse it was enjoying this. Grief and rage tore through me. I aimed my gun, squeezing off shots until the slide clicked empty. The creature flinched, hissed again, but the wounds were already healing, black liquid knitting itself closed. It tilted its head, then lunged towards me. Survival instinct took over. I dropped the useless gun, dove into the icy water. The current was strong, dragging me away from the creature and Rob's lifeless body. It lingered on the shore, screeching in frustration. For a moment, I thought I might have a chance. The whole river is unforgiving. I slammed into rocks, the frigid water squeezing the air from my lungs. Somehow, I kept my head above the surface, gasping, carried further and further downstream. The roar of the water drowned out any sounds from behind I couldn't tell if it was following, or had given up the chase. Night was falling when I somehow managed to haul myself up on a gravel bank. Shivering, teeth chattering, I took stock. Gun gone, radio probably waterlogged. My leg throbbed where I must have smashed it against the rocks. I was alone, miles from the ranger station, with no way to call for help. But somewhere, deep down, a stubborn piece of me refused to just lie down and die. Rob wouldn't want that, and even in the face of the impossible. Damn it, I wasn't some animal for that thing to hunt for sport. Hours passed in a blur. I stumbled along the river bank, following the meager moonlight. Every sound was the creature, a snapping branch, an owl's call. I was almost delirious from the cold, from fear and grief, when I saw a glimmer of light through the trees. A cabin. Old and ramshackle, but standing. A frantic hope sparked inside me. I dragged myself towards it. The door creaked open, unoiled hinges screaming a warning. Inside was the bare bones, a dusty cot, an old wood stove, some survival gear hanging on the wall. Shelter. More importantly, a first aid kit. I tended to my leg, crudely bandaging the worst of the cuts and gashes. My hands trembled, but the action was grounding pushing back the tide of despair. Under a pile of blankets, I found a scratched-up satellite phone. It was a long shot, but I prayed for a signal. Static. Then a crackle, a voice breaking through. Search and rescue are you receiving? 
My voice cracked as I choked out my location, a rushed description of what happened. They didn't believe me, not at first. Creature attack? Ranger Hayes, are you injured? Possible concussion? I knew how it sounded, rambling and half-crazed. But I described the creature in chilling detail, the burning eyes, the inhuman speed. The silence on the other end of the line was heavy. We're sending a team, the operator finally said. Try to stay put. It'll be daylight soon. I didn't sleep. I couldn't. Every creak of the old cabin made me jump, the gun I didn't have a phantom weight in my hand. The smell of rot and something acrid haunted my nose, even though I knew the creature couldn't be here. Couldn't be. Dawn brought the helicopter, the relief team in tactical gear, and a thousand questions I couldn't answer. They found the clearing, found Rob's body, hideously mutilated. They found no trace of the creature I described. Only my half-mad ramblings and a river washed clean by the relentless current. The aftermath is a mess. Officially, Rob's death is a tragic accident. Maybe it was, I'm not sure anymore. They think the attack on me was a bear or cougar driven mad by mange, hence the strange appearance. I didn't argue. What can you even say? The whispers follow me, the ranger who lost it. Some days, I almost believe them myself. But there's that look in their eyes, the Park Service investigators, the ones who saw Rob's body and have been tracking rising, animal attacks, in the area. They know something's out there. Something unnatural. Nights are the worst. I dream in flashes of teeth and shadows of those burning black eyes. I wake in a cold sweat, the scream lodged in my throat. They put me on leave, prescribed sleeping pills that don't help. The nightmares are relentless. I keep thinking about that cabin, about the sense of wrongness that clings to this whole area. There's a legend, an old native story about something dark that walks the deep woods. A hunter that's not quite human, that craves something worse than flesh and blood. I used to laugh at that kind of story. Now, I'm not so sure. One thing I do know, I'm not staying here. Got a small place lined up on the East Coast, as far from the Olympic Peninsula as I can get. City life. Maybe the concrete jungle will feel safe after this. But some part of me... The stubborn part that survived that day wonders how long I can run. If this thing found me once, what's to stop it finding me again? I glance at the battered satellite phone on my desk, my finger tracing the crack on the screen. Maybe there are others who hunt these kinds of creatures, if they even exist. The thought is as terrifying as it is compelling. I haven't turned the phone on. Not yet. But someday, someday, I just might. My name is Amelia Torres, and this happened to me on June 19, 2016. I've been working for the Park Service on and off since college. Love the solitude out here in Big Bend National Park. It's hard to explain. The desert, it feels old wise. There's something about the vastness, the way it puts you in your place. Today was like any other. Patrol the Chizos Basin, check on the campgrounds, the usual. This heat, it drains you, but there's a certain rhythm to it. Had lunch, sat for a bit by the creek down in Oak Canyon, enjoying that little patch of shade. Late afternoon, I got a garbled call on the radio. Something about hikers reported missing up near Emery Peak. Two teenage girls vanished from the trail. Dispatch was scrambling to get a team up there, but I was closest. My gut clenched. Missing persons are rarely good, 
even with the best outcome. The Emery Peak Trail is rugged. You've got those stunning views, but one misstep can be deadly. I started up the trail, trying to get ahead of the storm I saw brewing in the distance. Radio was patchy up this high, so it was just me, the rocks, and that nagging worry in the back of my mind. Found the girls' abandoned backpacks a ways off the trail, just past the nasty switchback. That's where things took a turn for the strange. Claw marks were raked across the rocks next to the packs. Big ones, no cat I'd ever seen around here. And something was just off about them. Too many claws, angles not quite right. That's when the first scream split the air. High pitch cut off sharp. Cold fear washed over me. I drew my gun, started moving up the slope towards where the sound came from, my boots scraping against the loose shale. The second scream turned my blood to ice. I knew that voice. It was Sarah, one of our summer intern sweet kid, here on a wildlife studies scholarship. I charged up the last stretch of the incline and burst into a small clearing. And froze. Sarah lay sprawled on the rocks, her shirt soaked in blood. Over her crouched, I still struggle for the words. Tall, impossibly tall, with limbs too long and thin, ending in vicious claws. Its skin had a mottled, leathery look, stretched tight over bone. The head bald, with bulging veins tracing its skull, and its mouth was twisted into a mockery of a grin, full of rows of needle-like teeth. Worst of all were the eyes, bottomless, empty pits that seemed to burn into me. The thing let out a hissing, clicking sound, almost like a laugh, and lunged at Sarah again. I don't even remember deciding, just reacting. I fired once, twice, three times. The echoes of the gunshots were deafening against the canyon walls. The creature staggered back, a spray of inky black blood staining the rocks. It hissed, a terrible, chilling sound, then turned and vanished into the brush with unnatural speed. I scrambled to Sarah's side. She was barely breathing, her leg a mangled mess. I ripped off my belt, used it as a makeshift tourniquet, then fumbled for the radio. But it was dead, probably busted in the scramble up the rocks. The storm broke then, rain lashing down, the sky turning an ominous, bruising purple. I hoisted Sarah onto my back, her weight shockingly light, and stumbled back towards the trail. Going was agonizingly slow. Lightning flashed, and in those bursts of light, I swear I saw that thing, slinking behind the rocks, always just out of reach. By some miracle, I made it back to my truck as the last light was fading. Got Sarah loaded, radio for help as I tore down the mountain, driving recklessly. One hand clamped over the tourniquet to slow the bleeding. The EMTs met me at the trailhead. They took one look at Sarah, then at me. There were questions, but I only half heard them the world already blurring at the edges. My last clear memory is watching them load Sarah into the ambulance, and the flicker of hope I desperately clung to. Word traveled fast after that. Park was closed, search teams went up Emory, armed to the teeth. They didn't find the girls. Didn't find a trace of the creature either. Sarah, she survived but lost her leg. Can't even imagine what she went through. My statement was dismissed as trauma-induced delusion. Standard protocol, I get that, no matter how much I swear it was real. They quietly transferred me to desk duty. Towns giving me the side-eye, tourists too. Everyone thinks I just went crazy out there. Some nights, I almost believe it myself. But then I remember those eyes, that clicking laugh, the smell of rotten meat and something chemical lingering under it. I keep thinking about a story one of the old-timers told me once, 
about something dark and strange that's been out in the desert longer than any of us. A hunter turned hunted. Laughed it off at the time. Not laughing now. There's a box under my bed. Inside, there's a hunting rifle, high-powered, not standard park issue. I haven't touched it since that day. But lately, I've found myself staring at it more and more. I got the distinct feeling that whatever's out there, it's not done. That maybe this whole thing is far from over. Nights turned into a waking nightmare. I jolt awake, heart pounding, convinced the creature was crouched just outside my window, its hissing laughter echoing in my ears. They offered sleeping pills, gave me a shrink to talk to. Neither helped. My little apartment felt like a trap, the desert beyond a hostile wilderness I couldn't face, but couldn't ignore. Weeks dragged on. Sarah was out of the hospital, learning to navigate life with a prosthetic. I visited her once. The light in her eyes was gone, replaced by a haunted look I knew all too well. We didn't talk about what happened, didn't need to. Turns out, shared trauma doesn't always forge a bond. Sometimes it just creates a chasm between you. Then came the disappearances. Tourists, locals, reports trickling in of people vanishing out in the desert. No trace, no witnesses, nothing like the attack on Sarah and the girls. Too clean, too, intentional. The park officials downplayed it, blamed the heat, careless hikers. Deep down, I knew they didn't believe that any more than I did. One sweltering afternoon, I sat in a dusty, deserted parking lot at the edge of the park, the rifle lying heavy across my lap. I'd quit the service, no point pretending anymore. Town was practically a ghost town anyway, fear hanging heavier than the heat. The waiting felt endless. When the shadows finally began to stretch, I knew it was coming. A prickle at the back of my neck, that same animal instinct that had saved my life up on Emery Peak. I got out of my truck, rifle at the ready. The creature rose from the brush at the edge of the clearing. Moonlight gleamed on its skin, outlining the unnatural angles of its form. Those terrible eyes locked onto mine, and its fang mouth twisted into that sickening mockery of a smile. It let out a hissing laugh that sent shivers down my spine. This wasn't about hunger or territory. There was a cruel intelligence in its gaze. It was enjoying this, savoring the fear. I raised the rifle and fired. The creature jerked, black blood spattering the sand. But it wasn't enough. It lunged, a blur of darkness. The impact knocked me off my feet, a scream tearing from my throat. The hot stink of its breath washed over me, claws raking across my arm, tearing through skin and muscle. Pain consumed me, white-hot and blinding. Then silence. I lay on the ground, gasping, vision fading. The creature was gone. Had it retreated? Was it waiting to finish the job? The trembling wouldn't stop. I fumbled for the first aid kit I kept in my truck. Had to patch myself up. Had to. Had to do what? Run? Even if I could, where? Hide? For how long? There was only one thought that cut through the haze of pain and terror. This wasn't just about survival anymore. Not for me. Not for Sarah, or the missing, or for whoever this thing would target next. It was about ending this. The aftermath is a blur. I managed to drive, somehow, back to town. Went to Sarah's place first. Wasn't thinking straight, just some primal urge to warn her, to arm her, to do something. She wasn't there. Found a note stuck to the door. Gone up north, staying with family. A flicker of relief cut through the fear. At least she was safe. Next stop was the old ranger station on the edge of town. Place was abandoned, 
most of the remaining staff relocated after the disappearances. But I knew where they kept the backup armory heavy-duty stuff, the kind they didn't take out on patrol. Broken, alarm warbling futilely against the desert silence. Loaded my pockets with flashbangs, spare ammo. Couldn't carry much more, my wounds were screaming in protest. When I stumbled back to the parking lot, my truck was gone. Clever thing, wasn't it? Knew how us humans thought. Cut me off, strand me. A wave of nausea washed over me, but underneath it, a cold resolve hardened in my gut. It didn't matter. I'd walk if I had to. The desert night was alive. Every rustle, every cry of a night bird seemed to carry a sinister echo. Stumbled along, guided by moonlight and a gut instinct screaming at me to head back towards Emery. There was a reckoning waiting there, I knew it. By the time the first light began to paint the horizon, I'd reached the base of the trail. My legs felt like they would buckle, pain radiating through my entire body. Found a jagged rock, sat for a moment, catching my breath. I loaded the rifle, the motion almost ritualistic. This was where it would end. The creature, or me, may be both. The hike up was a haze of agony. My vision blurred, the world tilting crazily. But I kept going. That damned stubbornness that had saved me before, now driving me to what was likely my doom. There was a strange peace in that, a letting go. Wasn't about fear anymore, hadn't been for a while. It was about rage, and a grief so deep-seated it felt carved into my bones. Reaching the clearing was almost anticlimactic. It lay empty, bathed in dawn light. I stood at the center, rifle held loose at my side. Was it toying with me again? Letting the dread stretch out. Then I saw them. Bodies laid out in a grotesque offering, the missing tourists, the locals. Eyes staring, limbs twisted in impossible angles. And in their midst, Sarah broken and small. Something inside me snapped. With a roar I barely recognized as my own, I charged towards the creature. It materialized from the shadows, hissing in fury. I fired the rifle blind, emptied the flashbangs at its feet. Disorienting bursts of light and noise filled the clearing. And through it all, I never stopped running. I slammed into the creature, tackling it to the ground. We became a tangle of limbs and claws and desperate snarls. Then its claws found purchase, sinking into my side. White-hot pain exploded, but I clung on, fueled by a primal fury. I reached for its face, my fingers finding the hollow of its eye socket. And I gouged. It roared, a terrible sound that echoed through the canyons. Thrashed wildly beneath me, tearing into my flesh with renewed frenzy. But I held on. Pushed my thumbs deeper, felt warm, viscous fluid coat my hands. Finally it went still, an awful, gurgling sigh its last sound. The light faded from its eyes. It was over. How long I lay there, I have no idea. When the rescue team finally arrived, drawn by the gunshots and the creature's dying cries, I was barely conscious. The world swam in and out of focus, their faces a blur against the harsh sky. Someone was yelling, something about shock and blood loss, but it all seemed a distant echo. All I could focus on was the creature's carcass, the inky blood pooling in the sand, and Sarah's still form just a few feet away. I had ended it, but the cost, the terrible cost. And with my last ounce of strength, I turned away. Some aftermaths are too painful to witness. My name is Elias Cartwright and this happened to me in July of 1997. 
I was a rookie park ranger in Yosemite, fresh from my forestry management degree and full of wide-eyed idealism. Don't get me wrong, I was prepared for the rough and tumble of the job, but not for whatever that was. It started as a missing persons case. An older couple, the Millers, had disappeared while on a hiking trail. Routine enough. I joined the search team and we scoured the area. Nothing turned up that first day. Day two, we expanded the search radius, hitting some lesser-known paths. I ended up taking point on a winding, heavily forested route leading to a waterfall. Anyone who knows Yosemite knows there's plenty of danger aside from getting lost cliffs, wild animals, flash floods, you name it. The trail was quiet. Too quiet. The usual bird song and rustling of leaves felt strangely absent. I shrugged it off, attributing it to my rising nerves and the seriousness of the situation. After a couple more hours, I saw the waterfall through the trees. And that's when I saw the blood. It was splattered across the rocks at the base of the falls, a gruesome trail leading towards the dense woods on the far side. I hesitated, hand drifting to the safety catch of my sidearm. Protocol dictated waiting for backup, but my gut twisted with dread. This wasn't a simple accident. I followed the blood trail into the trees, the silence now oppressive. The air crackled with a tension that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Each step brought an expectation of discovering something terrible. That expectation proved chillingly accurate. The body wasn't the Miller's. It belonged to a young woman, maybe mid-twenties. I won't detail the condition of her remains. Let's just say whoever or whatever did that was no typical predator. An image flashed through my mind, an old ranger's campfire story about someone finding similar mutilations, the work of an unknown cryptid deep in the backcountry. I'd scoffed at it then. Not so much now. I marked my position on the GPS and was about to radio it in when something moved in the shadows a flicker at the edge of my vision. I spun, gun drawn, but there was nothing there. That's when I saw it out of the corner of my eye again, a glimpse of lean movement just beyond the trees. It was huge, far bigger than any bear. Fur, I thought, dark against the shadows. But the way it seemed to flow rather than shift with the motion, wrong. A low rumble came from the trees, not a growl, more like a vibration that went right through my boots. And that shape, it moved closer. Yellow eyes blinked in the darkness, twin pinpricks of malevolent light. They were too high off the ground, the spacing too wide. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't something I recognized. Every instinct I had screamed at me to run, but my feet were frozen. It charged. I barely had time to raise my gun. I squeezed off two shots, the cracks shattering the forest stillness. One hit, I think. It let out a roar that shook the branches, a shriek of rage overlaid with something inhuman. Then it was gone, bounding away through the undergrowth. I radioed for help, my voice shaking. The search and rescue team arrived with a speed that told me they thought I'd cracked. They found my markings by the girl's body, signs of a struggle, the blood trail. But of the creature, nothing. There were more victims after that. Always alone, always with strange, inexplicable injuries. The official explanation became elusive mountain lions, unconfirmed bear attacks, whatever fit the mangled evidence. I knew better. They never caught it never even came close. I left Yosemite a year later, haunted by the memories and the sound of that impossible roar. To this day, I don't know what I encountered. Whatever it is, it's still out there.
My name is Kellen Scott, and this happened to me in August of 2014. I'm a National Park Ranger, have been for the last 15 years, bouncing from post to post. I've hiked some glorious trails, seen sunrises that'd knock your socks off. But I was stationed in the Mount Rainier area of Washington for the weirdest couple of months of my career. See, my job's not just about happy campers and keeping trails clean. We get all sorts, the lost, the injured, the occasional less-than-savory type looking for a remote place to cause trouble. What I dealt with was none of the above. The first sign was a missing person report. A solo hiker... Seasoned guy named Gary Beltran just vanished off the Wonderland Trail. I know that route like the back of my hand. A multi-day loop with plenty of spots cell service goes kaput. But Beltran wasn't unaccounted for a few hours, or even overnight. It was a full five days before the call even came in. And get this, his family only started to worry when they got a bizarre text supposedly from him. Only it was all garbled, the words nothing but gibberish, like a cat walked across a keyboard. Weird? Yeah, but people get disoriented, phones glitch out, not yet enough to make me think this wasn't some routine case. Two weeks into the search, we found a campsite just off the trail. Beltrans, judging by the gear. Here's where things turn from strange to, well... There's no other word for it but wrong. His tent was ripped, like something big clawed it. There was blood, a lot of it. Not in splatter patterns, like from an animal attack, but in ragged streaks, as though something was dragged away. Whatever did that, it wasn't a bear, wolf, or cougar. We know their marks. This was deliberate and precise. I had this prickled down my spine, like I was being watched. I filed a detailed report, but my superiors chalked it up to bad luck. We searched for weeks, never found a body. I thought that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. A few days after Beltran's disappearance, there was another report. This time it was a young couple on a day hike. They claimed they saw something in the trees near Spray Park, said it moved too fast, was too big to be any animal they knew. Dismissed as nerves, tourists see bears and mistake their size all the time. Still, I was on edge. It was like a dark cloud had settled over the whole area. Things escalated after that. Sightings became more frequent. Whispers started. Hikers passing each other on the trail, comparing notes. They all described the same thing, massive, moving with impossible speed, always lurking in the tree line just out of sight. Then, the worst happened. It was two days ago. A ranger buddy of mine, Leanne, was doing trail maintenance a couple miles off. That's when the radio calls started coming in people reporting screams from near her location. I grabbed my gear and took off at a dead run, calling out her name. When I reached the spot, Leanne was gone. There was another patch of blood, more torn fabric, that same sickening sense of something monstrous dragging her away. The other hikers were pale-faced, babbling about a huge, dark shape, eyes that glowed like embers. I'm writing this from a motel room outside the park. Got the hell out of there as quick as I could. I've filed my report, but I don't think they believe me. They think it's stress, grief over Leanne. Hell, maybe they're right. Maybe I've snapped. But I know what I saw, what those hikers saw. And most chilling of all, I know I wasn't the one being hunted. We were the bait. Something out there is impossibly big, impossibly fast. It stalks these woods, moves like a shadow, and the worst part. I think it's smart. I think it's learning. I haven't slept in two days, afraid if I close my eyes, I'll see those glowing eyes in the dark.
My name is Silas Briarwood, and this happened to me on July 22, 1997. It was my third year working as a park ranger in Yellowstone National Park. Now, I love everything about the job. The trees, wildlife, those geysers that never fail to impress it's my kind of paradise. I spend a lot of time alone out here. Don't get me wrong, I see tourists all the time. It's talking with my fellow rangers that's scarce. I don't mind. Solitude suits me. But sometimes, sometimes I wish I had company out in the thick of the trails. The day this all started, I set out early. There'd been reports of downed trees blocking one of the more popular hiking trails, and it was my job to clear the way. Routine work, the kind that fills most of my days. I grab my gear axe, saw, the usual, and head into the woods. I find the first fallen tree a little past noon. A big, old pine came right down across the path. I get to work, sawing the trunk into manageable pieces. It's hot and sweaty despite the shade, so I take frequent water breaks. The work is slow, physical. Still, I'm in a good mood. Can't beat the scenery. That changes when I hear the scream. My blood runs cold. It's a woman's voice, high and choked off. Sounds close, coming from deeper in the trees. I drop my saw and take off running. My heart is pounding, adrenaline making my vision tunnel. I'm yelling. Hello? Can you hear me? No answer. Then again, another scream, louder this time. I push through the undergrowth, and there she is. Young woman, maybe twenties, blonde hair, collapsed against a rock. She's shaking, sobbing, blood all over her hands. Hey, I say, dropping to my knees beside her. Are you all right? What happened? She doesn't speak, just points shakily further down the path. Her hands are covered in red, and it's not her own. Following the direction of her frantic gestures, my stomach drops. There's a body. Man, lying face down in the dirt. It's still, way too still. I don't hesitate. Stay here, I tell the woman. I approach the body cautiously. He's wearing a backpack with a bright green sleeping bag strapped to it. Probably a hiker. I call out. Sir? Are you all right? Silence. Kneeling, I gently roll him over. That's when I see, well, that's when I wish I hadn't. The man's chest is, there's no word for it. Torn open is the closest I can get. It's like something huge clawed at him, ripped out his insides. There's blood in, and bits of him I can't even identify. All over. It hits me then bear attack. There have been a few sightings recently. Rising to my feet, my brain is working full speed. The woman is in shock. I have to get her out of here, and I need to call for help. But how? My radio is back with my gear, near all the felled trees. Do I leave the woman to get it? What if the bear comes back? I'm frozen with indecision when I hear it, a crunching sound of twigs and leaves from the woods behind us. I whip around, heart in my throat. It isn't a bear. It's tall, too tall, and it moves wrong. Two legs, yes, but hunched over. Its arms are long, dragging on the ground, and it's covered in dark fur. No, not fur, matted hair. The thing tilts its head, like it's curious. Its eyes are small and deep-set in a face that is both human and not. The jaw is too wide, full of long, yellowing teeth. It snarls silently, and that's when I see the blood on its hands. The woman screams again, and I yell for her to run. The creature lunges forward, but I'm already moving. I bolt back the way I came crashing through the underbrush. 
It's a desperate sprint. Adrenaline gives me speed I didn't know I had. I hear her cries behind me, those horrible snarls growing closer. My breath burns in my lungs, my legs threaten to give out. I reach the clearing where I left my tools, and I see them the radio, my axe. I snatch up the axe as the creature bursts from the tree line. For a wild moment, I consider facing it, protecting the woman I've now dragged into danger. But it's a ridiculous notion. This thing isn't an animal. It's something twisted, something wrong. And I'm not a hero. I yell at the woman, telling her to run towards the park entrance. Grabbing my radio, I do the same. My legs pump, my breasts come ragged and shallow. I call for backup on the radio, voice panicked, giving the ranger station the bare essentials of our location. Static answers me, then the voice of Janice, the dispatcher, tells me help is on the way, to hang tight. Hanging tight is what I can't do. I hear the snarls behind me. They're closer with each passing second. Janice's voice crackles over the radio, telling me helicopters and a team of rangers are inbound. They're minutes away, but minutes might as well be years. The creature will be on me before then. I push myself harder, my lungs threatening to burst, my limbs on fire. I hear the woman scream behind me. Then, it cuts off abruptly. A terrible silence falls over the forest. Dread settles in the pit of my stomach. Tears of frustration sting my eyes. I run faster, branches whipping my face. I have to make it. The trees thin out ahead. I can see a break in the foliage, an opening, and that's when I spot it, the old fire watchtower. Scrambling up the rusted ladder, I curse my trembling hands. The platform is only twenty feet up, not much of a defense, but it's better than being on the ground. Gasping for air, I risk a look back. The creature's there, at the base of the tower, staring up at me. It snarls and paws at the metal rungs, but it can't reach. The throbbing in my legs lessens, the pounding in my head begins to subside. I catch my breath, clinging to the railing for dear life. That's when I hear the helicopters, the most glorious sound I've ever known. They circle us, three of them. Powerful spotlights pierce the dimming forest. My adrenaline spikes again. Not in fear this time, but the hope of rescue. I wave my arms. One of the helicopters descends, stirring up leaves and dust with its powerful blades. Below, I see rangers spill out of the chopper, men and women I know, some of them trained with firearms. They move in a tactical formation, rifles raised, shouting for me to stay put. But my eyes are drawn to the trees. The creature has vanished back into the shadows. It takes what feels like a lifetime to get lowered down in a harness. My legs turn to jelly the moment I touch solid ground. Two rangers flank me, guns pointed outwards, as we make our way into the woods. We find the man's body, the gruesome scene just as I left it. Then, we find the woman. What's left of her? The aftermath is horrific, far worse than the initial sight of the man's corpse. I won't, I can't, put the details into words. The rangers are hard men, weathered by the things they see out here, but they blanch. One of them turns aside to vomit. There's no sign of the creature. It's vanished like a ghost, though the evidence of its inhuman brutality is sickeningly real. The rangers collect what's left of the woman's body, solemnly bagging the pieces. The man will be easier, at least. I'm spared none of this, the ordeal not ending even with my rescue. That night, I'm back at the ranger station, giving my statement. It's a blur of well-meaning faces, offers of coffee and blankets, concerned questions. 
I answer mechanically, still trapped inside my own head. I replay the day, the screams, and the sight of those, those things the monster left behind. Janice, the dispatcher, pulls me aside. I know you're in shock, Silas, she says gently. But we need to talk about what you saw back there. That thing. The word hangs in the air, heavy and ugly. I describe it as best I can. The hunched posture, the matted hair, the too wide jaw, and those damn eyes. Deep set and gleaming in the dark like an animal, yet with a chilling intelligence behind them. They search the woods the next day and the day after that. No sign of the creature, not a footprint, not a strand of hair. The parks shut down, tourists turned away, a whole section of Yellowstone cordoned off. They even bring in search dogs, but the creature is gone, swallowed up by the wilderness as if it were never there. The aftermath, well, let's just say it's been hell. Reporters swarm like vultures, local ones, then national ones as the story makes headlines. Beast of Yellowstone, they call it, stirring up a frenzy. Conspiracy theorists pop up, raving about aliens, government experiments gone wrong. Some even accuse me, saying I made it all up, or worse, that I'm the monster. I'm put on leave, of course. Mandatory counseling sessions, psych evaluations, the whole nine yards. They ask the same questions over and over. Could it have been a bear? Did I see it clearly? Did I imagine the whole thing? Maybe it was the shock, the trauma. They keep searching the woods, finding nothing, and I know the doubt lingers in their eyes. The worst part is, I doubt myself too. There were no witnesses, no evidence of the thing except for what it did to those people. The nights are a waking nightmare. I see the creature's face, those gleaming eyes and yellow teeth, the blood on its claws. I see the woman what's left of her, and I hear her screams. Months pass, and the Fuhrer dies down a little. No new attacks, no sightings of the creature. Life in the little tourist town near the park starts to return to normal. But it's not normal for me. I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched, that the thing is still out there, waiting. I've started checking over my shoulder every two minutes, jumping at any odd sound. The trees that once felt like home now seem menacing, every shadow a potential hiding place for the monster. A year later, I quit the park service. I can't bear the sight of the forest anymore. I move away, try to rebuild a life somewhere the woods aren't looming over me. Some days, I almost succeed. I tell myself it was a rogue bear attack, a freak accident amplified by trauma. I force myself to forget the thing's too human face, the calculating malevolence in its eyes. But then, then there are reports. Not in Yellowstone, no. Similar attacks hundreds of miles away, deep in other national forests missing hikers, bodies torn apart, the same gruesome signature. People whispered the same name, the beast. They don't know the details, how could they? But I know. It's out there, still hunting. The news stories fuel my nightmares. I start carrying a gun learn how to use it. Some nights, I leave my blinds open, watch the shadows shift in the streetlights below. Just in case. The other rangers, well, we don't talk about it. Not directly. But sometimes, at reunions, I catch them watching me, their eyes filled with pity or something worse. Like they think I've broken, that I'm one step away from snapping hunting a monster that may only exist inside my head. And maybe they're right.